Okay, so uh, I'm formally welcoming you to the defense of Matteo Frigo uh, PhD, sorry. Uh, so thank you to all to have, uh, to have accepted to be in this defense. Um, so I will start by presenting the jury. Uh, so I'm using, sorry, the order of, of uh, writing in the PhD. So there is no, uh, so Ragini, you will come in, in the end instead of being the first as a lady. Uh, but well, I'm, I'm first, uh, well, the first one in the jury, well, first usually are the uh, rapporteur, a reviewer. Uh, so the, re the first reviewer is, ah, ah uh, Maxime Decoteau. So Maxime, want to tell from, uh, well, from University of Sherbrooke, Canada, but maybe you want to tell us a few words. Yeah, hi everybody, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm live from uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. And uh, I'm a professor in computer science and uh, actively working in diffusion MRI for the past 15, 20 years. Did my PhD in Rachid de Riche's group in 2008. Okay, uh, next uh, we have Jean-Philippe Thirian at EPFL in Switzerland. Jean-Philippe. Hello, uh, hello. I was happy to see you from Lausanne, Switzerland. So yes, I am a professor at EPFL. I'm the head of the group working in computer vision and medical imaging. And indeed, we also have been working in diffusion for quite a few years uh, in, in tractography and in microstructure imaging. And as a matter of fact, we, we had the pleasure to have Matteo as a master student. And then he, he left and uh, I'm very happy to, 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 to see him again after, after the PhD. So uh, very happy to, to be here. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Alfred and Wender from uh, uh, Max, Planck, Max Planck in Germany. Alfred. Yeah, <laughs> hello everybody. So I'm also very happy to, to join you in this jury and uh, to be part in the PhD defense of Matthias Frigo. So I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. And um, I'm mainly concerned with developing of new methods in diffusion MRI and bring this in cognitive applications. So I'm really looking forward to this defense. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Ragini, uh, a professor in uh, University of Pennsylvania and in the hospital, I think, but uh, I don't have the exact, uh, so Ragini. Hi, um, so I'm professor at in radiology and neurosurgery at UPenn in Philadelphia, where it is snowing today. I wish I was in Antibes. And I've been involved with Mateo since my first trip in Antti with his research at least. And I am extremely excited that he's finally completing it. Um, and I'm looking forward to the defense. Thank you for Thank having me. Thank you. So then um, proceeding to the local members, uh, Samuel Delaurier, Gauthier. Uh, hi everyone. So as Theo said, I'm a local researcher in uh, France more precisely at INRIA in Sophie Antipolis Mediterranean. Um, I've been working in diffusion MRI and uh, function in general medical imaging for a while now. And I've had the pleasure of supervising Matteo, uh, co-supervising rather, Matteo uh, for the three years of his thesis. So I'm also very much looking forward to this presentation. And last but not least, the supervisor, Rachid de Riche. Thank you, President. Yeah, I'm Rachid de Riche leading the uh, Athena group where uh, Matteo did his uh, PhD. The uh, focus of our research is on uh, brain imaging and with a particular interest in uh, brain connectivity with uh, diffusion MRI, EEG, MEG, and other modalities. And uh, I'm really very, uh, very, very happy to see you here because uh, we have collaborated by the past for some of you many years ago, for others maybe much more closely. And it's always a great pleasure for me to, to be in, uh, 
in a meeting, uh, exchanging with you, and thank you for having accepted to be part of this uh, of this year. Okay, thank you. I forgot to present myself, so I'm Theo Papadopoulo from the same group, and I will act as the president of the jury, as you may have understood <laughs> for, for the people on the streaming. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, Matteo, now it's your time. So you will have 45 minutes to present your work after what we, the jury will ask you some questions. So you can maybe share your screen already. And yes, uh, I am doing that. Um, can you see the first slide? Yeah, everything is fine. So okay. it's, it's your... You, you're the, 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 the mic is, uh, is, up, is, is for you, so you have 45 minutes to present. Thank you very much, Theo. So good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I am Matteo Frigo, and I did my thesis under the supervision of uh, Rashid Derish and Samuel de Roy Gautier. And the title of my thesis is Computational Brain Connectivity Mapping. During the next 45 minutes, uh, I will present you some results that we got uh, in uh, three different problems of diffusion MRI modeling, which are the multi-compartment modeling, the study of the brain network topology, and the problem of tractography filtering. So mapping and understanding the human brain is a central challenge of contemporary science, and we actually made substantial progresses in the course of, in the course of history of science itself. But the challenge is still difficult because the brain is a complex multi-scale biomechanism where microscopic interactions have macroscopic effects and vice versa. It is a very subject-specific brain, so we have to study all, all of our brains. We cannot just study one brain. Uh, it, is an, uh, it is an organ that changes over time because uh, we, it changes with learning, it changes with development, aging, and evolution. And most importantly, it is characterized by a very high dimensionality. It is composed of around 80 billion neurons that are connected by something like 160 kilometers of myelin axons. And myelin axons are the elongated part of neuronal cells, of the neuronal cells that compose the brain. And these uh, axons uh, compose the white matter that link the nucleus of the neuronal cells in the gray matter to the axonal terminations of the neuronal cells that are in other gray matter regions. So the type of data that we're going to consider in the study, in our study of the brain, is diffusion MRI. Diffusion MRI is a specific magnetic resonance technique that is able to measure the freedom of water molecules to diffuse in a certain direction. It is able to provide a substantial information on the shape of the substrate. And with different models, we are able to achieve a different level of details in our analysis of this uh, subject, of this uh, uh, substrate. Uh, with diffusion MRI, we are able to infer properties of the brain at a wide variety, a wide, a wide range of spatial scales. In particular, at the microscopic scale, we can look, for instance, at the anisotropy of the underlying tissues, or we can look at the volume fractions, which indicate how much of a certain tissue there is in a certain location, or we can look at the fiber orientation, for example. While at the mesoscopic scale, we can do what we call tractography. Uh, which uh, gives us a description of the white matter anatomy by means uh, of uh, an, an estimation of the geometry of the fibers that compose the white matter. While at the macroscopic scale, what we can do is connectomics. So we can study the connections between the gray matter regions that we have produced uh, previously with tractography. And uh, uh, in this way, we can get uh, a network, so a graph on which we can do some graph theoretical analysis. And this is the most abstract uh, level at which we can study the brain. In uh, this thesis, I treated problems at these three distinct uh, scales. At the macroscopic scales, I treated the problem of multi-tissue, multi-compartment models. At the mesoscopic scale, I treated the problem of tractography filtering, which is a, a specific part of the tractography uh, pipeline. Um, also, by discussing the possibility to include functional information within the tractography filtering process. While at the macroscopic scale, I did some studies on the topology of brain networks uh, by looking at them from the point of view of brain alignment and similarity. Starting from the first contribution, which concerns uh, multi-tissue, multi-compartment models. Uh, first of all, we have done this part of the work in collaboration with uh, Rapgur Fick, who is a former student uh, in the team and is now employed at uh, Tribune Healthcare in Paris. And uh, so we studied brain tissue microstructure. 
And basically by doing this, what we want to do is to extract some local interpretable features of uh, the tissues that compose, that compose uh, the brain from some uh, brain imaging technique. In particular, what we focused on was the volume fraction of tissues. Therefore, we wanted to look at how much of a certain tissue there is in a certain location of the brain. And uh, looking into what we get from a past gradient spin echo sequence that, that gives us the diffusion MRI signal S, we see that we can write this signal as the product of two components. One is a um, non-diffusion weighted component somehow, which uh, is uh, the S0 component that solely depends on the echo time of the acquisition and gives an indication of uh, the volume of the signal, of the magnitude of the signal while uh, this uh, is uh, multiplied by what is called the signal shape, which uh, depends on the direction of the diffusion of the, of the gradient that we apply to the, uh, to the sample. And uh, therefore being direction dependent, it depends on the diffusion and it gives information about the shape of the substrate. So we have this uh, magnitude times shape duality in the description of the diffusion signal. And, uh, what we usually do when we want to study uh, multi-compartment models, uh, uh, when we want to study the diffusion MRI signal is to do the so-called multi-compartment modeling where we take the, the acquired signal as zero, we divide it by the, we divide it by the non-diffusion weighted component as zero, and we retrieve the signal shape in this way. This signal shape will not uh, depend on the echo time of the acquisition because uh, we factored it out. And we want to describe this signal shape E as the linear combination of more elementary compartments, more elementary components that compose this, uh, um, this signal shape. And in particular, these uh, compartments will have a certain shape that depend on some parameters PI. And each of these compartments has an influence on the signal shape of the signal, which is quantified by the signal fraction pi i. For instance, uh, what we can do is to model the anisotropic uh, component of the signal with a, with a stick and the isotropic component with a ball, uh, yielding in this way a uh, two compartment model uh, on top of which uh, we can, uh, for, example, for example, estimate the signal fractions of the stick and the ball compartments and the microstructural parameters related to each of these compartments. We can do this estimation from uh, some data that we acquired. Um, what we did in the previous slide relies on an assumption that is hidden behind the operation where we divided the acquired signal S by the non-diffusion weighted component S0. And this assumption is that the tissue, the tissues modeled by each compartment on the right-hand side of the previous equation all have the same as zeros. And uh, is, this, is this assumption correct? Well, it is not correct because the S0 image uh, the, the equation the, for me, the, the equation that describes the S0 image depends on the T2 time of uh, the, on the T2 relaxation time of the underlying tissues uh, on which uh, diffusion MRI is sensitive. And we know for a fact that the T2 time of different tissues like the white matter and CSF is different. Therefore, also the, their S0 will be different. And we have actually always known this uh, since we began looking at brain images because uh, in a T2 image, uh, which is basically an S0 image, we see that the white matter is black and the CSF is white. So there is a contrast between these two. And if we quantify this contrast by means of techniques such, such as the Dolander response function estimation uh, technique, we see that this difference is subject specific. Therefore, we have to find a way to take this difference into account in our, in our model. And that's what uh, we presented in our thesis, which is a unified view on the ways uh, in which we can uh, uh, include this kind of information. We, we call this way uh, as multi-tissue, multi-compartment models. And what we do is to model directly the signal as the linear combination, again, of multiple compartments. We still have the signal shape, but we multiply it not only by some fraction, but also by the uh, S0 of the specific compartment I, which will depend on the time. The, uh, can, can you see? Because I'm getting a notification that my connection is unstable. No, that's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so the S0 is then multiplied by the volume fraction instead of the signal fraction, because we are not explaining the signal shape, but we are explaining the whole signal. So this is the, signal the volume fraction of the uh, tissue associated to the compartment I. 
Notice that in principle, this would need multi echo data to be completely disentangled. And this is what has been done by Gelever Art, Bumping, and Gong in the last two, three years. Um, but what we can do to exploit the same model with single T data is to estimate a priori with some third part technique the S0 associated to its compartment, hard code it into the equation, and then estimate the microstructural parameters and the volume fractions directly as before, just taking into account these differences. This idea of reweighting the signal shapes by the specific S0 model by the shape is not completely new in the field because it has already been exploited since we began uh, talking about FODF estimation with uh, the works of Maxime de Couture and Jacques de in 2007. But, all, but more recently, this has been exploited in the specific context of multi tissue uh, modeled models by Ben Jurison in 2014, where he presented the multi shell, multi tissue uh, constraint spherical deconvolution algorithm. Um, as I said, we, uh, we presented this uh, at ISB and ITN last year. And uh, no, I actually didn't see it, haven't said it uh, yet. But now we also submitted a paper in neuroimaging, in neuroimage uh, containing this uh, in, in unified formulation. And a final note that I would like to, to mention is that under certain assumptions that we can discuss later if you're interested, um, we have that the volume fractions uh, FIs can be retrieved from the signal fractions phi i's that we knew before with just a rescaling operation. So it's a very simple operation that doesn't need to refit the data or reacquire the data, which would actually happen if we needed the multi echo data. So a common example of multi compartment model of which we provide the, the multi tissue formulation is the standard model of white matter that has been summarized by Novikov in 2018. This model comprises uh, three compartments. The first compartment accounts for the intracellular component, the second for the extracellular component, and the third for the isotropic component of the signal of the, of the tissues, uh, the signal of, from the tissues uh, that here is uh, referred to, refers to the cerebral spinal, cerebral spinal fluid uh, component. The anisotropic components uh, are convoluted here with a Watson distribution that accounts for fiber dispersion. And notice that each term, so each compartment, has the uh, signal shape, has the S specific S0, and has the volume fraction. So we are, we are indeed in a multi tissue framework. We can do some assumptions on top of this, uh, on top of this equation. In particular, we can say that uh, if we consider all the three S0s to be equal, we have a one tissue uh, formulation. So we're basically modeling one tissue with three compartments. And this, and this corresponds perfectly to the old multi-compartment modeling. While if we say, for instance, that uh, the S0 of the intracellular and the extracellular are equal and are, for example, uh, um, associated to the S0 of the white matter, while the, S, the S0 of the CSF is, this, is different, then we are modeling two tissues at the same time with three compartments. At the end, we see that uh, if we consider the three uh, different zeros to be, to be distinct, we have uh, a three tissue formulation. So we have this duality between tissues and, from, and compartments. Notice that the one tissue and two tissue models can be disentangled, uh, can be solved with the uh, single T data because we can estimate actually the uh, zero of the white matter and the CSF with uh, some third part technique like the technique that I mentioned before of uh, this Lander. While uh, the three tissue, um, the three tissue model needs multi echo data uh, to be to be solved at least uh, until now. Maybe in the future we will be able to find heuristics uh, to, to distinguish uh, the as of the intra and extra a, a priori. But for the moment we need multi echo data. We did a simple experiment using the same model as a forward model. We did ten thousand simulations with it. We simulated, so we simulated the signal uh, 10,000 times for it. We added some noise to each MSNR of 30. And then we fitted the three volume fractions using the different assumptions that we made in the previous slide. So with the one tissue model, two tissue model, three tissue model, and a corrected version of the three tissues that employs the tautology constraint with some uh, correction of the that correction of the tautology constraint that uh, takes into account the differences between signal and volume fractions. We did both simulations and fitting with DMIPI, which is a public tool that we developed within the team. And the results that we get are summarized in this figure. 
where we show the distributions of the absolute errors that we get from each uh, um, from each experiment for each uh, compartment so what we see is that the um, the absolute error decreases as soon as we increase the number of tissues uh, that we consider and this happens for all the three compartments so the message here is that the number of tissues that we use really matters we did also some uh, experiments on uh, in vivo data from the from uh, using three subjects from the hcp database we so these data these data are single echo so we could use only the two tissues model we model the white matter and the csf and we computer the corresponding as zeros and what we get first of all is that uh, the signal fraction of each subject the signal fraction and the volume fraction of the white matter um where uh, uh, white matter by my fraction of the white matter i mean intra plus extra are different and we have that the volume fraction is higher than the signal fraction this difference is reflected also at compartment level at single compartment level because here you see that the signal fractions that are uh, displayed in blue for each uh, subject are lower than the volume fractions uh, uh, the distribution of the signal fraction is lower than the distribution of the volume fractions uh, that are in orange for each subject in the case of the intracellular and the extracellular compartments while we have the contrary for the csf compartment these uh, uh, counter correspondence this, uh, this inversion of, uh, of trend is due to the type of contrast that we have between the white matter and the csf uh, the s0 of the white matter and the csf so to summarize this first contribution we can say that uh, uh, first of all signal fractions and volume fractions are not interchangeable concepts secondly we say uh, we we had we showed evidence of the fact that we should use all the available s0 information and in particular with single T multi shell diffusion MRI data, we can use the two tissue model and fit the volume fractions with the MIPI. Finally, uh, we uh, suggest that the previous studies should be reinterpreted, taking into account this difference between signal and volume fractions. As I said, we went uh, last year to ISB and HPM with the parts of these results, uh, and uh, uh, this whole analysis has now been submitted to NeuroImage and is now with the reviewers. In the second part of my thesis, I will, I'm presenting you in the field of tractography filtering. And part of this work was done in collaboration with Ragini Verma from the University of Pennsylvania that is present here today, and Jungon John Kim from the City University of New York. New York. So first by tractography, what we mean is uh, local tractography, where we see from the great matter white matter interface, we follow the local orientations uh, given by an FODF estimated with constraints by the convolution. We do anatomically constrained tractography and then to assign a streamline to an edge of the connectome what we do is to look for to do a local search uh, assignment around the endpoints uh, of the streamlines what we get can be either a binary or a weighted uh, network depending on the application that we are interested in as several studies in the last uh, 10 10 12 years showed uh, we, we know that tractography has a, a number of limitations that all boil down to the fact that streamlines are not axons, or at least most of them boil down to the fact that streamlines are not axons. In particular, uh, they are streamlines are volumeless entities that just give a qualitative description of the trajectories followed by the fiber pathways. And uh, for a number of technical reasons, the resulting connectomes are poorly informative. In particular, two facts have been identified. First, connectomes have an important amount of post positive connections. And secondly, streamline count is not a reliable way to measure axonal connectivity. At the end of the day, what has been identified as the original scene of tractography, it is that uh, tractography per se, it is, it is not quantitative. And to restore this, uh, the quantitativeness in tractography, what have been proposed, among other things, um, is a class of techni techniques that go under the name uh, of tractography filtering techniques and basically what they do is to modulate the influence of individual streamlines into the formation of the connector so the each streamline is assigned to a weight x x streamlines s is just is assigned to a weight xs that uh, that quantifies how much the streamline either explains uh, some uh, diffusion of a derived map and or um, 
dispatch to some prior that we associate to the Notice that associating a streamline to a weight equal to zero means that basically we discard the streamline from the system. So after getting this, this weight, so what we do is to create the weighted connectome by associating each edge, uh, for instance, the one that connects regions i and j to a weight cij that is equal to the sum of all the stream of all the coefficients associated to the streamlines that connect regions i and j among the factorial filtering techniques the ones on which we focused on the on uh, during this thesis are shift 2 commit and its evolution commit 2 and live what we showed is that all of them can be rewritten in a way that uh, fits uh, into this uh, generalized cryptography filtering framework, uh, where we have uh, an optimization problem that tries to optimize a functional that has a fitting term, a regularization term, and some constraints. So the streamline coefficients s, x in the in the fitting term are mapped onto some uh, uh, diffusion onto some some data, some uh, space of data that usually corresponds to some diffusion MRI derived map by means uh, and uh, this mapping between the streaming coefficients and the space of data is done by a linear operator a that maps uh, the streamlines onto the space of data this linear operator acts uh, as a forward model that usually at least usually is defined in such a way that it respects either the volume fraction prior so we have uh, the um, volume fraction model where we have that streamline coefficients uh, are the cross the mean cross sectional area sub so cross sectional area uh, that uh, uh, is associated to the streamline and it uh, maps uh, towards the uh, axonal volume fraction map or we can do the so-called microstructure informed tractography tractography where our forward model a is some um, acts as a multi-compartment model where each uh, streamline coefficient is the signal fraction associated to the specific streamline and it maps directly to the diffusion MRI signal so shift two is able to model the volume fraction, uh, the volume fraction is able to use the volume fraction model and it employs some standard inverse problem regularization like the Tikono for total variation regularization. While commit and commit do, commit two are able to model both the diffusion MRI signal and the volume fraction model. And in particular, commit two is able to employ the group sparse regularization about which we will talk later. Finally, life is basically a particular case, a particular case of the first version of commit that is uh, able to model the diffusion MRI signal and can employ some standard L1 regularization. So the big difference between these three is in the constraint because all the three employ a non-negativity constraint, as you can see here, but shift two does not allow any streamline to be associated to a coefficient equal to zero. Therefore, we will never have a coefficient which is discarded from the system. And this comes from the theory, not from uh, any any other uh, heuristic. So we summarized this problem, this, uh, this approach, this generalized tractography filtering in Talon, which is a Python package that uh, is one of the contributions of this thesis. Um, Talon means tractograms as linear operators in neural imaging. And basically what we are able to do is to transform a tractogram into a linear operator and to solve the associated inverse problem that we showed before. The difference with uh, commit and shift is basically with Talon, one has the full control over the creation of the linear operator uh, from streamline to separation of different existing components, depending on the formal model, and the actual creation of the matrix that, is, matrix that is behind the linear operator. So we have the full control over this part of the problem. The code is available online, and we have some documentation, and uh, I welcome you to check it out. So the first question that we asked ourselves uh, con concerning tractography filtering is, does it make sense to use it? Or more specifically, uh, do TFTs have significant effects on the topology of connections? Well, the answer is yes. And we published uh, this result uh, in the Journal of Neural Engineering last year. And what we did was uh, to take a high resolution data set, multi-shell uh, multi 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 data set from the HCP database and a clinical uh, resolution data set a uh, single shell data set that includes uh, some healthy um, controls and some patients affect, affected by traumatic brain injury. We did some standard uh, tractography like the one that, that uh, we described before. And then we filtered the uh, tractograms using SIFT2 and commit. We used the original implementations because Talon was not ready yet at that time. Then we built the uh, connectomes using the Desic and Atlas 
and in particular we did related connectomes uh, using streamline count for reference and then shift to and commit uh, weights with these connectomes what we did was a graph theoretical analysis and in particular we looked at the density of these connectomes uh, then and how it changes with respect to the enthalpy of t we looked at the small wordness properties of these networks, and in particular, we looked at integration and segregation measures of these networks. And finally, we looked at the how the comparison, the edgewise comparison between TBI patients and healthy controls is changed with respect to the employed tractography filtering technique. What we got out of this experiment is that the density of the connectomes does not change when shift two is employed. While when commit changes, uh, when commit is employed, the different the, the density of the connectomes significantly changes, and uh, interestingly enough, there is not a constant constant difference between because in the high resolution data set we got only a two percent difference between the unfiltered connectomes and the commit connectomes, and the difference is in terms of density. While for the clinical data set, so the, the healthy controls and the we got a 19% difference in terms of density between the unfiltered connectomes and the commit connectomes. Moreover, integration and segregation measures are both changed by the use of shift to and commit, both between themselves, so they do not give, they do not tell the same story, and with respect to streamline count. So they say something differently with respect to what we had before. So Summarize this, what we have is significant density, integration, and segregation differences due to the choice of the TFT. Um, also, we looked, uh, as I said, at the edgewise comparison between patients and controls, and the edgewise comparison answered the question, which connectome edges show differences between TBI patients and healthy controls? What we found is that the set of edges that show differences when we do not filter the connectomes is different with respect to the set of edges that uh, uh, show differences between healthy and patients, healthy controls and patients, when shift to two and commit are employed. Notice that differences are between each pair of, uh, uh, of analysis. So we have indication that uh, uh, TFTs change uh, the interpretability of studies, uh, um, of studies that include uh, uh, the analysis of healthy controls versus uh, patients affected by traumatic brain injury. So yes, in the end, the tractography filtering techniques do have significant effects, significant effects on the topology of connectomes. And part of these results were presented at OEPM, and all of them were included in our publication in the Journal of Neural Engineering of last year. The second contribution we did in the field of tractography filtering, as I said before, concerns the possibility to include functional information in the process. And it is motivated by the fact that tractography produces, as we said, an important amount of false positive connections. And these false positive connections can be up to twice as, up to twice as detrimental as the false negatives. And a significant breakthrough was done by the presentation of Committee 2, Committee two of last year uh, that was uh, published by Simona Schiavi and her colleagues, where they proposed a shift of paradigm where instead of uh, discriminating individual streamlines, we, they wanted to propose uh, to promote sparsity in the space of streamline bundles. So consider bundles of streamlines and eliminate bundles of them, not single streamlines. On top of this, we observed also that uh, there is a significant correlation between axonal connectivity and functional interaction. And this has, already, has, been, uh, already, has already been exploited in other frameworks uh, like the connectivity informed the maximum entropy on the published in 2019, in which uh, uh, they basically show the how function and structure are linked also from the, from this point of view. And uh, we summarized these two uh, facts in uh, what we call the, our functional informed tractography filtering technique, where, which is basically a tractography filtering technique that includes a prior um, that uh, says that bundles of streamlines that connect regions showing higher functional connectivity between themselves should be penalized less during the filtering process. And we do this by solving a non-negative group sparsity uh, problem with, uh, that can be solved, for instance, with Talon. And uh, we do this with a careful design of the regularization term, where each streamline bundle G, each group of streamlines G, is penalized more 
uh, if uh, um, the regions that the bundle connected by the bundle have high so it's penalized less if uh, there is a higher higher functional correlation between the regions connected by the bundle and it is penalized more if there is lower functional correlation between the regions connected by the uh, by the bundle we did uh, some very preliminary uh, experiments uh, with this model and in particular one experiment on one single HCP subject so this does not let us gain any general conclusion on the goodness of the method, but it allows us to get some insights uh, on what it does to the net, to, to, to the track program and to the and to the connection that we get out of it. So we did uh, tractography, as we said before, we bundled the streamline according to the pairs of regions that they connect in the desert and Kilimi atlas. We computed the functional correlations uh, as the person's correlation between the time series associated to each region in the atlas. And then we did tractography filtering with the volume fraction model and the functional informed uh, framework that we defined in the previous slide. The results that we get is that compared to the group sparsity regularization, so without functional priors, uh, which is uh, which symbols somehow to commit to, we have a very similar uh, data fitting and uh, a very similar number of cap streamlines, but we have uh, um, we have 27% less uh, groups uh, of uh, kept, uh, kept yeah, we keep 27% less groups uh, of streamlines. Therefore, we have more sparsity, more parsimony in the model somehow associated to uh, a reasonable, reasonably uh, comparable uh, um, error uh, distance in terms of fitting error and number of streamlines. And this is something that we like to have when we insert a new prior because we like to have more parsimony without losing in, ter in terms of fitting and other metrics. So to summarize uh, what we did on tractography filtering techniques, uh, we showed that they changed the topology of structural connectors. We showed that uh, some of them have a common mathematical structure that can be exploited uh, in Talon. And we showed that we have a sound way to include the functional information in the process. As, um, so some of these results uh, were presented at uh, conferences during the last years, uh, and uh, there is the general paper that I mentioned before. Last part, uh, last contribution of my thesis um, that I'm going to present now concerns the brain alignment and similarity problem. This work was done in collaboration with Emanuele Natale, Emilio Cruciani, and David Puder from the uh, Coati team at NIRIA here in Sofia de Polis. And it all starts from the fact that, that uh, when we build connectors, a fundamental step is the choice of the atlas that we use. We can choose an atlas that has anatomical, multimodal priors, or it is built, uh, built based on the structure of the brain network or on the functioning. And we have atlases that have a certain number of visions. So we have other atlases with higher resolutions, or, or we even have atlases that, have, that can be uh, designed at the resolution that we want. So we have multi-resolution atlases. And uh, uh, this implies that uh, make, choosing the atlas is not a trivial problem. And we wanted to help ourselves in making this choice by looking at this problem with the following question. So given an atlas, how robustly does it capture the topology of the structural connectome? And uh, the prior that, uh, so the assumption that we have behind this experiment is that within a, in a, a homogeneous cohort of subjects, the, um, the brain networks should be as close as possible. They should be very similar amongst, amongst themselves. And we measured this robustness by means of alignability. Alignability is uh, associated to the graph alignment problem, where the, the goal is to find a map M from the vertices of one graph onto the vertices of another. And the challenge here is to find this mapping lonely, ex looking exclusively at the edges of the two networks. Notice that the graph alignment problem has been uh, out there for decade, for a lot of decades now. And uh, it has been applied to whatever field of network science that you can imagine. And more recently, it gained attention also in neuroscience. In particular here, uh, we can mention the work of Yusuf von Smoglioglu of 2019, where he, he looked at the structure function mapping problem from the point of view of graph alignment. So first thing that we need is a way to evaluate the quality of an, of an alignment. And what we did was to define a novel similarity measure, which is the graph jacquard index. And we defined our graph jacquard index between two graphs as the similarity measure given by the ratio between 
the summation of the minima and the maxima of the correspondences between the edge weights of the two graphs. And looking at this example, we see that, for instance, uh, the edge that connects uh, um, nodes A and B in the first graph has a weight of one, and in the first graph has a weight of zero because it is absent. So what we do in the ratio is to put a zero at the, at the, at the, uh, at the numerator because it is the minimum between zero and one, and at the denominator we have we we add a term equal to one. We do this for every pair of nodes, so for each edge, and we get the two summations. And at the end we get a ratio which is in, in this case is uh, 0 0.05. Therefore, therefore we can say that we have a fairly low similarity between these networks. While if it was closer to one, we could have said that the two networks are pretty similar. Notice that when the two graphs are binary, this is just pure and plain jacquard index between sets. Uh, so, so what we get out of this is a novel similarity measure that generalizes the concept of similarity for, between, uh, for uh, less structured data, in this case, the similarity between sets. Also, the graph jacquard index straightforwardly applies to the graph isomorphism, graph isomorphism problem. It has a simple interpretation, as we showed in this example, and it is able to induce a matrix, which is given by 1 minus j in the space of weighted graphs. And this is a nice property in several applications, several data science problems uh, that are now very trendy and interesting, I would say. So now that we know how to evaluate the goodness of an alignment, we want to retrieve uh, the alignment itself. And the algorithmic approach to finding this alignment is to compute a signature for each node in the two graphs that we want to align, and then find correspondences between these signatures that, signatures that we computed. And the signature that we defined in our in our work and we, that we proposed in the thesis is inspired by the vice pilot lemma graph isomorphism test. Basically, to compute the signature of a node U, we do a breadth first search uh, with depth K and with L. So basically, we go at most two steps far from U, and at each step we consider L. Uh, so, so for a choice of K and L is equal to two and two. We go at most of two steps apart from you, and at each step we consider the two most uh, the two uh, edges having the highest uh, um, edge weight. What we do so is to build a vector H u, which is our signature associated to the node u. That in the first entry has the volume of u, in the second entry, uh, second and third entries it has the uh, edge weights uh, of the edges that connect uh, directly u, and then we do the same at uh, uh, the second level connection. So basically what we have is a way to define, given a certain node, to define a vector that describes somehow the connectivity pattern around this node. And we used this signature to define our WL, WL align technique, which, uh, uh, our, which is the, the alignment technique that we proposed, where basically what we do is to compute the WL signature of each node in the two graphs, then build a bipartite graph where each uh, edge has a weight equal to the Euclidean distance between these two, uh, the two signatures, the two the signatures of the nodes that it connects. This bipartite graph will be complete, and we can find the alignment that we wanted, the alignment M that we wanted, as the minimum weight bipartite matching that can be retrieved with the Hungarian algorithm, which has complexity, which is a no of. Uh, a big O of N cube, which is fairly low compared to the combinatorial network nature of the of the problem itself. So, the experiment that we did to answer our original question uh, uses uh, 100 HCP subjects, which are high resolution data. We did the cryptography as we always do, and then we built the connectors using streamline count on 23 different atlases. First of all, we considered the anatomical atlas of Desi and Kilani. Then we considered the the multimodal um, atlas uh, of uh, Glasser. And then uh, we consider 11 different, uh, different resolutions of the structure based atlas of uh, Gachardo and 10 different resolutions of the Schaefer atlas, which is based on function. We use the WL align to retrieve the network and the graph jacquard index to compute the similarity between the target graph and the aligned, uh, aligned network. 
So for each atlas, we saved the ground truth matching between the subjects that we have because we know the labels of each of these uh, of these atlases. But we will act as we uh, as we didn't know them in the in the experiment because for each pair of subjects, we compute an alignment M with the WL align for a specific choice of the necessary parameters, and we evaluated the, the goodness of this uh, alignment. Yes, with the graph jacket index, as we said before, but also with the J ratio, which is a modified version of the graph jacket index that takes into account the complexity of the problem given by the uh, magnitude, so the number of nodes of the, in, in the graphs. And then we used also the node matching ratio, which tells us how many times that we were able to match, correctly match a specific node. Some node -based, norm based strategy here represented here we use the Frobenius norm. Um, where basically we take the, the Frobenius norm of the difference between the adjacency matrices of the target graph and the aligned task. So the results that we show here in all these plots, uh, the higher the better. So basic an atlas is represented in blue, is the blue dot here, and everything is a function of the number of parcels. So the basic an atlas is the one that performs best uh, uh, with respect to almost all these uh, metrics. Um, and it performs best, uh, better in particular than uh, the Gashardo and the Schaeffer atlases, which can be retrieved also in a comparable, as a, a comparable resolution. And another interesting fact is that the, is that the uh, multimodal atlas of uh, Glasser performs more or less in line with the Gashardo atlas, which is purely based on structure. So we can say that the Glasser atlas correctly captures the structure, uh, the structural part of the of the network, uh, something that may look obvious, but we were have we were very happy to find is that the glass the Gashardo atlas performs better, which is based on structure. We recall performs better than the Schaeffer atlas, which is purely based on structure. And we kind of expected this, but we we expected this because uh, we are doing structural connectivity studies, not functional connectivity. Finally, what we observe is that WL align, which is our technique, aligns uh, networks better than FAQ, which is the state of the art technique. And we can discuss the details about the FAQ later if you are interested. And the final uh, conclusion that we get is that the Frobenius norm is not an adequate way to um, describe uh, to describe the alignability. So the if we if we map our alignments onto the cortex of the brain, we see that uh, uh, here we, we are showing for each region the, num the percentage of correct node matchings. And we see that we don't really have a structure that we can exploit to understand what's going on because uh, every atlas does more or less what it, what it wants. And uh, we don't have any left to right symmetry to exploit to understand what's going on. And uh, uh, different resolutions of the atlases perform in different ways. Also, something that we noticed before in the previous results, and those we should. Uh, Notice also here is that the higher the number of parcels, the more difficult it is to actually match the um, the connectors. Therefore, we have that uh, fewer parcels perform better. To summarize this, uh, we uh, what we did was to propose a novel similarity measure between a weighted graphs, which is the graph jacket index. Then we proposed a novel graph alignment technique, W align. And we got new insights into how atlases, uh, the choice of the atlas influences the topology of structural networks. We submitted this work uh, at the Network Neuroscience. And after a first round of comments, we are now preparing our vision to send to the reviewers. To conclude, I would like to uh, summarize uh, what, we, what we did in this thesis. And so at the three different scales uh, that we can inspect with diffusion MRI, we studied the, the microscopic scale by studying multi-tissue multi-compartment models, showing that multi-tissue modeling is feasible with single T data. Then at the mesoscopic scale, we treated the tractography filtering problem, and we showed that several tractography filtering techniques have a common mathematical structure that can be exploited with Talon. Also, these TFTs change the topology of structural connectomes. And the functional information can be included in these TFTs. We showed a simple but sound way to do that. Finally, at the, at the, at the macroscopic scale, 
what we did was to study the brain alignment of similarity problem. We proposed the graph jackpot index and we proposed the WL align technique, which is a sound, general, and efficient graph alignment technique that does not actually rely on, on any brain related uh, heuristic. Therefore, it can be applied also in other domains outside of uh, uh, neural imaging. And finally, we got that uh, uh, we obtained the results concerning the fact that uh, the choice of the atlas affects uh, the topological robustness of the structural network. In the future, what we would like to do is to explore the volume fraction versus signal fraction differences uh, with respect to different subjects, uh, different cohorts, uh, different pathologies, and any other difference that can be explored. We would like to be able to filter tractograms explaining functional data, not structural data, not diffusion of right data. And uh, in particular, we would like to employ some careful design of anatomical, functional, and topological priors into the definition of filtering techniques with the final goal of uh, defining a joint, a joint structure function filtering that comprises both functional and structural data in the fitting, in the regularization, and everywhere. To do this, what we would need, and this will be a, a useful tool in general for the study and evaluation of tractography and conatomic pipelines, is what we would need is a synthetic data set that is multimodal. So it, it has both functional and structural information. Finally, what we would like to do is to use alignability. So what we presented in the last contribution as a general metric for studying uh, the, for studying the specific steps of the conectomic pipeline. Because here we focused only on the choice of the atlas, but the conectomic pipeline is very long and there's so much to study in every single step that we, and we can assess some properties with, uh, we believe that we can assess some properties with the liability. We published, uh, uh, we presented a, a number of works uh, at scientific uh, and international conferences, uh, and some of them have been submitted uh, to journals uh, like Neuroimage, Network Neuroscience, uh, and uh, the journal, journal of Neural Engineering. And um, we provided uh, a significant amount of code that we are, it, it took some time to write it. Uh, publishing the Talon and also contributing to other projects uh, that have been developed uh, by the community. Finally, there are some works that I did not present in this thesis, uh, but uh, they did that I did during these three years, and then cons and they consist uh, on some works uh, on the structure function mapping problem. Uh, another that so this work was presented in Media, it was published in Media. Then. Uh, we studied uh, the resolution gap between uh, three-dimensional polarized light imaging and uh, uh, diffusion MRI, and we studied also how to track microstructural biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease uh, with uh, advanced multi-shell diffusion MRI scalar methods. This project was funded by the European Union under the ERC Advanced Grant uh, Computational Brain Connectivity Mapping. And I would like to take 30 seconds to thank uh, all my lab mates uh, and all the people that I've been uh, interacting with uh, during these years, uh, working and uh, working and talking to you about our works uh, has been just pure luck for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Matteo, for perfect timing, or almost perfect timing. So you. 45 minutes, well, 46, but that's, that's fine. Um, so now it's the time for the questions. Uh, and I will first give the, 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 the turn to the, the two reviewers uh, uh, of, uh, of your PhD. Uh, so let's start with uh, Alfred. Alfred well, give me a second that I stop sharing the, the, the slides. But well, you can, well, you can, well, keep keep sharing it because you there okay. might be some. Well, we, we had some small. Uh, well, what you can do before anything is try to stop sharing and restart sharing because the images we got were a little bit pixelized. So hopefully, redoing yeah, it to, might improve things a little bit. I'm trying to do that, uh, and I can't really do that. Uh, so give me a second. Uh, you? We. Oui. Uh, Alfred is not actually a reviewer. Oh, sorry. The reviewer are Jean Philippe and uh, Maxime. Just oh, sorry, reviewer. sorry. I I I didn't have the, the title under the the. Sorry. 
sorry for that. So we'll start okay. with uh, Jean-Philippe then. <laughs> Okay. Just, just a second that I, I, I had to close. Yes. Anyway, it's a, don't not, not pay too much attention to the resolution. It's a bit too late now. Yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's that's okay. Thank you very much, Matteo, for the for, for the presentation and uh, for the excellent presentation. I must say, uh, where you have been able to show uh, the breadth and the depth of your work, and I think this is really important. Uh, I really would like to to underline that. Uh, and to congratulate you on the, on that work because of this breadth and depth. Really, as you as we all have seen, you have tackled at least three different domains of brain connectivity analysis. All of them being very timely. The microstructure is very timely. The the, the tractography is something that still that needs more, even more work. So you did it. And the graph analysis is very, very, very also very timely and very interesting. And, and in each of them, you did great contributions. So this is really uh, exceptional. And I want really to congratulate you on that. Uh, each of them could be a thesis by themselves. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, well done. And the manuscript also uh, corresponds to that quality of the work. So congratulations. And again, as I said in my very short uh, introduction at the beginning, I'm extremely happy to see that you continue to work on what you have started a little bit with us and you expand it that uh, tremendously. So uh, we, we are extremely happy. So I will have a few questions, maybe not to, not to take too much of the time of the other reviewers and to leave questions for the others as well. So maybe I, I, I would like just to start, sorry to ask you that, but can you reshare your, your slides and go to 15? Absolutely. Even if you didn't manage to, to improve the quality, I think it would be good enough. I, I switched it to the PDF, so okay. Yeah, well, it's not that, it's not better, but okay. Slide 15, you said? Yes, 15. It's, it's yes. not better, but yeah. So I, I just would like to start uh, start by, by asking you to comment on this experiment that you have there. Uh, so can you first tell us more about the tissues that you have been simulating? So the, the, the actual ground truths that you have done how realistic are those tissues? What kind of configuration they have? What kind of complexity you have in those tissues? Uh, because I understand that you generate them to have your simulations and then to, to have the grand truths, right? Yes. So first of all, uh, thank you for your question and for taking the time to review my thesis. Uh, so uh, the type of simulation that I did, the, the substrate that I aimed at simulating is very simplistic. So this is not uh, the probably the best simulation experiment that it, we could have done, but it, uh, it is composed basically of one. So we are modeling only one direction. So there are no crossings, first of all. And uh, the parameters that we chose were tuned in such a way that we are modeling something that is uh, uh, that resembles the configuration of a, uh, of, a, of a location where there is a mixture of white matter and CSF that uh, happens uh, in some locations in the white matter, more specifically around uh, the corpus callosum between the corpus callosum and uh, the, the ventricles, for example, like in, in those regions. The, um, the, the, the scheme that we used is the one on the database. We could have certainly gone for more realistic uh, schemes, but uh, what we wanted to do with this experiment in the end was really to, to give a, a, a proof of concept uh, of what happens uh, if uh, the uh, substrate was this. So it was more to prove the theory than to actually show, uh, show its usability in uh, the specific, in, in the whole white matter, because that was uh, the, what, we, what we did uh, in the next exper experiment and what we could also do in the future. Also by doing more simulations uh, uh, with more realistic uh, phantoms that, that are, do not include just one direction, for example, including crossing, crossings at different angles. Uh, and also uh, like using, as, uh, as you pointed out, more realistic uh, uh, types of substrates uh, and more realistic uh, simulations also, because here we use the, we, I want to remark that we use the, the same model for forward and back problems and inverse problems. So what we could use, for, for instance, uh, is, uh, is a more realistic simulator based on Monte, Monte Carlo simulations, for example, like the ones that are developed also in the team that you lead uh, by, uh, Jonathan, uh, by Jonathan. Other simulations of that type. I really like uh, actually the idea of uh, using the simulator of, of Jonathan because uh, 
I was talking to him about the possibility of doing that in the future. Yeah, I think it would make sense in at least in two respects. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, I, I'm really impressed by that work. Uh, I mean, th what you are doing there, because it, it, it really shows indeed that uh, we are not measuring what we think we, we are measuring. And uh, what I would like to explore more with this, my question is uh, how important it is to, to to use the, the actual tissue fraction and not the signal fraction. I, I have no doubt that you are right. I'm just asking whether it, it, it allows to estimate those quantities with more accuracy. If you have evidence that it does. On your simulation, it does. Now, if you go to real tissue, and I think this is the, ne the next slide, yes. right? Um, it's less obvious to how to interpret that slide uh, and those graphs. Uh, can you, can you tell, us, tell us, knowing the architecture of, of the white matter, or at least uh, know, knowing what you know about the architecture, does it allow you to have a better estimate of the tissue fractions uh, than what we used before? If you look in a microscope in the white matter, you actually have, as far as we know today, it's very difficult, and I'm talking under the control of Sam here, uh, we, we have the tendency to overestimate significantly the amount of extractional compartment. And it seems that it's actually much more packed than what, what we think. Does it go in that direction, as far as you can see, with your method? So uh, with my method, actually, the volume fraction that I estimate is higher than the signal fraction. But as I said, I, use a, I used a very simplistic model that uh, and this analysis comprises all the possible configurations that we can encounter in the white matter. So we would probably need to look more into uh, the specific localizations uh, that, we, that, we, that we need to, that we can study. Uh, so to answer your question, um, the direction in which this goes uh, is uh, to, uh, is, well, small premises. We studied the white matter SF, which is another further simplification. Yeah. Because uh, they, they, there is also some differences in terms of a zero to disentangle between extracellular and no, intracellular. That I understand. Yeah, yeah. That I understand. So, uh, still you uh, have to grab for IC, EC, and CSF. Yes. There. But usually, what we can say is that the extracellular has a uh, a lower as zero with respect to the uh, wait lower yes lower as zero with respect to the white matter. So what we can say is that probably this simplification gives indication that uh, uh, it could be improved in the sense that uh, we get uh, uh, a better estimation of the extracellular in this sense. Uh, how this can be quantified? Uh, it is. Mm, well, we can address this question with, with further experiments, certainly by looking at, uh, at specific locations, as I said, because we, we, di we did a very, general, uh, a very general and preliminary analysis on the whole white matter. So there is a wide variety of configurations that needs to be taken into account. And uh, any conclusion that takes into account uh, specifically the extracellular is uh, somehow... Um, but I, I, I second to you and I agree with you that indeed uh, working with a, with a simulator, another simulator like ours, and, and trying to have a more complex configuration of the substrate more corresponding to, to the neuroanatomy would even sh show better your, the quality of your, of your results. Uh, on the analytical part, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear. Now, the, may, maybe indeed, uh, we, we can discuss further later on offline uh, how, how to, to apply that to, to, to more realistic uh, tissue models. Very good. Okay, maybe a second question. Uh, a couple of questions on the filtering now. Um, the first one is, is, a, is a question that actually comes from, from my group. So thank you, Gab, for asking the question online. Uh, so uh, did you study the effect of the number of brain regions in the topological analysis of the connectome that you have done after applying the filtering, uh, the variability should actually increase with uh, the number of regions and the size when they become so, smaller. So did you, did you investigate that? Not yet. This is definitely something that we want to do because uh, so this, uh, this uh, question goes well together with the last contribution also of the thesis uh, because uh, the number of, uh, of parcels uh, show, we showed with that experiment on alignability that the, num that the number of parcels uh, uh, affects the topology uh, of the of the brain network. So um, 
Definitely, we did not do that experiment, but it would be incredibly interesting. We have a couple of factors to take into account uh, during that experiment because uh, um, the more the parcels, uh, the, the lower somehow the signal noise ratio of the connector because uh, we have to distribute uh, uh, an almost equivalent amount of information coming from cartography among uh, uh, a higher number of nodes. Therefore, the, edge, the, the, the contrast between the edge weights would be lower. Uh, so we would probably need to balance this effect by means uh, of uh, probably considering more streamlines and carefully designing the, the cryptography filtering pipeline. Uh, but yes, definitely we did not uh, tackle that problem and we are looking forward uh, to do that uh, in the close future. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then maybe a last question for, for this round. And uh, maybe I, uh, if I have time, I might have more, but uh, not sure. Um, it's, it's about the, the, the functional informed filtering. Um, it, it's more a general question or a question of, uh, you know, not, not philosophy because it's too, it's too much a big word, but um, I'm always a little bit um, not, not skeptical, but uh, I always wonder how to to combine structure and function, especially in tractography, because at the end of the day, what you want is probably to detect uh, aberration in the functions, some problems in the function of your patients. Uh, assuming that th that changes in the function will appear before changing in the structure in the onset of a disease, for instance. Uh, so isn't there a risk in combining too much or relying too much on the function when you, when you filter your tractography. In other terms, what happens if you have a patient with a, 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 an altered functional connectivity? It will change your tractography as compared to, a, to an healthy control. Is it what you want? Isn't it a risk there? It is, it is definitely a risk. And that will be very useful in the comparison between uh, patients and controls, for instance, uh, because uh, having a high variation would uh, indicate uh, uh, that the, the, the subject is not a healthy person. Uh, so that would help, uh, as I said, uh, distinguishing the, the patients. But in general, the problem of uh, capturing these uh, uh, fluctuations and these dynamics, uh, so we are, we are mixing a very static information like diffusion with a very dynamic information like uh, uh, the function, which can come from functional MRI or even MEG or EEG that have an even higher fluctuation uh, with a much higher frequency. So in the end, uh, uh, yes, there will be, there is a, to a certain extent, there is a, a risk when we consider uh, non-healthy people, but in a general study of, uh, of healthy people, that would be, uh, the, the prior and the idea in general of including function, uh, functional information into the tractography filtering process, to me, it is a sound idea because uh, in the end, uh, as shown by a number of studies, uh, function comes from structure somehow. We can reorganize uh, how the function is expressed by variations on the structure, but uh, uh, somehow the, this, uh, this duality is still present. Um, uh, to, to link uh, uh, just a comment uh, on, on some implications of what you asked in your question, uh, in, this, uh, in this type of model, uh, we, at least in what we, we showed uh, in this design of the regularization term, we are only able to model direct connections uh, and uh, we, uh, we basically miss what is the, the, the dynamics because we are hard coding one single coefficient that expressed the whole, the whole function. Mm -hmm. But it would certainly be interesting to uh, find ways uh, to, uh, to encapsulate these dynamics uh, into the model. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, we, can, we, we have actually tried uh, and we will probably still try the next month uh, to include these dynamics uh, uh, in, the, in the fitting term by this careful design of the forward model. But, uh, but still, uh, the, the soundness of the prior that functional connectivity should be supported by the structure. I think uh, it, 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 is, it is a sound prior that has been shown to actually be significant, a significant prior. 
Well, I, I agree with you that there are indications that it should be used. For, for me, it's still not clear how to use it. As you very well said, the, the time scale is different. You have a very static substrate at some point and a very dynamic functional information on top of it. Uh, and uh, the relationship, indeed, there is a correlation, but there are many other factors that affect the functional connectivity uh, and the dynamics of the connectivity. So indeed, I think it's, it's very interesting, but uh, it, it very much depends how you, what you want to do. Uh, if you present that as a way to be more quantitative uh, on the structure, I'm not sure it's true. If you want to, to show that you are more sensitive to pathologies, then I would agree with you. But I don't think you can say that you become more quantitative in, ter in terms of the structure, the, the structural part. Uh, you had other information that is relevant, but uh, you have to be a bit careful how you use that, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you on the point. It's, uh, it's, definitely, it's definitely true that, uh, yeah, as we said before, the, the comparison against some, uh, between, between uh, some patient of some pathology and uh, a health control would be affected, but definitely within the same cohorted subject, this can be somehow yeah, I agree. That I agree with, exactly. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for your answers and congratulations again for the really good work, for the great work. And Theo, thank you for me. For, thank you, uh, I'm done on my side. Thank you very okay. much for your questions. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe. So next, the second the reviewer, Maxime. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks, Matteo, for the presentation. Thanks for the thesis. Uh, as you read in my report, I enjoyed the thesis. I enjoyed reading it. I think you have a, a skill to write well and to present well. So I congratulate you on that. Um, and uh, like Jean-Philippe said, you tackled a lot of different aspects of the diffusion world. Uh, microstructure, tractography filtering, and alignment at the end. So uh, this is ambitious. And I mean, you did a pretty good job. Well, you did a very good job doing it. Um, so I'm going to ask more global question, but also I might annoy you with a, a, a few specific questions as well. Um, so first, um, in your thesis, and not in the presentation here, but in the thesis, you used a lot the term isotropic volume fraction when you talk about microstructure models. And I think you associate it that a lot uh, with CSF contamination, at least in your head or in the way you wrote your first thesis, uh, your first draft. Can you tell me a little bit more about this isotropic volume fraction and, and what does it mean to have an isotropic volume fraction that is non-zero in deep white matter far from ventricles and CSF? And, so I'd, I'd like to hear you comment on that and maybe go back to your equation around the slide 10, 11. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so, well, just first, so we were crystal clear on this first. So I think it's this one, I believe. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for reviewing my thesis and for the detailed report. It helped me a lot, really, in understanding also the perspective of what I did. Um, Going to your question, so yes, that's the, when I say isotropic uh, compartments, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, CSF, but this is mostly due to uh, my attachment to a certain part of the literature where uh, we always see intracellular, extracellular CSF, which is uh, basically the recent articles uh, of uh, Dimitri Novico and the others. Uh, but certainly the isotropy part, can be uh, can be given by other types of uh, of, uh, of tissues and, uh, and components of the brain because the CSF is not the only type of tissue uh, uh, on which the diffusion signal uh, can be considered uh, isotropic. Any free water compartment, uh, what we call free water compartment, like uh, edema or whatever else. Uh, can be encapsulated in that. And that is uh, actually a limitation of what I did because uh, I considered the, the contrast with the CSF uh, uh, function, uh, with um, the CSF, uh, the S0 of the CSF, which is very different from the S0 of the white matter. Uh, so this contrast uh, somehow uh, guided the results uh, towards uh, this huge contrast between white matter, signal, white matter signal fraction and white matter volume fraction. So 
certainly there is a some limitation associated to this uh, but in general as you pointed out uh, the correct to assume that all isotropic compartments are associated to the cerebral spinal fluid because uh, there's a variety of types of tissues that can be associated to this kind of uh, of um, of isotropy so definitely in the final version of the thesis uh, i will do my best to re 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 reshape the message towards this uh, um, this multitude of possible of possibilities uh, in the modeling of isotropic uh, uh, compartments because that is definitely very interesting and very important uh, when we talk about uh, also pathologies uh, not only the plain white map plain uh, analysis white map concerning the second part of your question uh, about the possibility of observing csf in the deep white matter well certainly certainly if there is some it's uh, almost uh, negligible from the point of view of the fusion mri but what we wanted to, so as I said before, during the answer to the question of Professor Jean-Philippe Thierrain, uh, what we wanted to model was more the situation where we have a mixture of white matter and CSF, therefore the, 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 the boxes at the borders of two tissues somehow. So the interfaces between tissues. Uh, that's where this model is more realistic than anywhere else. Uh, so definitely this is not a model for the deep white matter. So we cannot, uh, at, in the middle of the deep white matter, as we as we actually show here, uh, so, we are, so these distributions show the distribution of the values uh, in the white matter mask. And we see that the, the CSF is much lower than we actually were able to measure. So in the end, this is a, this refers exactly to your, your second part to the second part of your question to the fact that uh, in the deep white matter and in general in the white matter in regions where we don't have a mixture of different tissues uh, we do not observe uh, a relevant amount of uh, cerebral spinal fluid i hope this answered the questions otherwise uh, right to, but but if you go back to the next slide you still see some biases between signal fraction and volume fraction you see a lot of uh, differences in the deep white matter here right you mean like uh, in, the, in, in the columns yeah, in the figures a lot of orange like dark orange in in the, you yeah, know, the yes, yes. so this refers to sing, to single boxes or or specific areas so there's a number of factors that could drive this uh, first of all the preprocessing of data that uh, we did not we did not do anything special so there are we all know that with better preprocessing we get more uniform maps but uh, in general uh, yes so the, actually it's interesting here to, in this image to show that here we were noticing a lot of csf already with the old models not only with the new with the new not only by taking into account the multi tissue components so the difference the contrast between the zeros of the two tissues so what we uh, what we had here was yes that the signal shape somehow was isotropic somewhere uh, and there was a relevant amount of isotropy in these boxes which could uh, say that uh, simply the model is not uh, so this this model that is very simplistic one direction one stick and one zeppelin that are aligned with each other with a simple Watson distribution this does not uh, describe properly the the deep white matter for instance and, and it's uh, it, i i find it normal that this model does not describe the whole white matter we have uh, much better models where, where for instance we can use fair harmonics to define an fodf here or we have constraints uh, uh, we can consider diffusivities to be free parameters i mean we can do much better from that point of view so the specific spots that you see here and there would be driven by the fact that we are studying uh, a substrate uh, with a model that in general regardless of the type of contrast that we put between the, the a zero of the different compartments in general this model would not be the best one great so i do agree with this response and i, I would encourage it to make it clearer in the statements because you know what the proper models should be and they're more much more complicated than this as you say absolutely uh, and so if you go back one again and we see the equation so 
on this one, on this version, how many unknowns to fit in every voxel? So here I don't make explicit uh, the unknowns because otherwise it would be two screens long. Uh, but basically what we have is, a, so the Watson distribution is uh, uh, symmetric along one axis that we have to determine. So we have two polar coordinates. We have uh, the uh, ODI, so the orientation dispersion indices uh, in this index associated to it, which makes it three. Then there are the three volume fractions. And then there are, uh, so here, the intracellular is a stick with fixed parallel diffusivity and the orientation is the same as before. Um, here, the Zeppelin has uh, um, parallel diffusivity equal to this one, to the one of the stick while the perpendicular diffusivity is fixed uh, with the, the tortuosity constraint. And then the radial diffusivity of the isotropic compartment is fixed. The three S zeros are fixed. So this makes it uh, um, theta and phi of the direction plus the ODI that makes it three and then the three volume fractions. Um, so we use the three, shell, three shells uh, of data and the three shells are enough because uh, what we have is basically that we have the volume fractions, the direction, and the uh, and the ODIs. That oh no, actually for this experiment, the everything except the fiber, uh, the volume fractions were was fixed. Uh, so it was only the volume fractions to be fixed. But yeah, and in general. Uh, three shells plus, plus B zeros uh, are enough because we have at most a depth of three parameters to be fitted. If, if we had also the diffusivities to, uh, to fit, for instance, the perpendicular diffusivity of the Zeppelin, this would have required one more, uh, one more shell. Um, but with the scheme that we, that we used, this is enough. So was that a motivation to keep the number of unknowns low somehow? Because of course, if you add crossing fibers and more unknowns in your equation, you would have needed data that you that we may never acquire. So that, that no, I was getting to that. Are you? Can you comment on the realism of these uh, signal models versus uh, the realism of the data that we currently have routinely, or even in the you know human connectome projects? Yeah, so uh, if we substitute the Watson distribution with some uh, spherical harmonic representation of uh, an FODF, we just need uh, a sufficient amount of directions uh, because uh, that uh, acts on the, on the directions level. Uh, while uh, for, the, for the amount of shell, this will be perfectly usable. So. But let's say you would want to add an isotropic free water uh, an additional Quite isotropic. No, so uh, an additional isotropic would have required uh, an additional shell because the isotropies uh, basically do not have the directional component that could disentangle them. And this is, uh, but in general, adding them would not affect uh, the other volume fractions, would affect only these two volume fractions because uh, they are linearly dependent. They would become linearly dependent in the system of equation of equations made by the directions and shells. Uh, but yes, definitely this is, uh, this is what would happen. If we add another isotropic compartment, we would need to add uh, another shell. That's perfectly true. And actually in relation to this, uh, I would like to comment also on how we use the commit in the uh, experiment of tract on tractography filtering about which uh, you made some comments in the- You're in the asking room. my own questions. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> I didn't have time to ask it yet. <laughs> but yeah, that was my next question. It's a perfect transition towards uh, the TBI uh, application. Yeah, exactly. So in the clinical data set, uh, I used this stick Zeppelin and Boyle model where um, all the diffusivities are fixed. And uh, basically, so the, the beauty of doing microstructure informed tractography is basically that we have an empirical sampling of these fiber orientations by means of the streamline segments. Um, we use the, these stick zeppelin and two balls. So uh, with the one single shell plus B zero, we could do that because uh, 
this was not to be estimated and all the diffusivities were fixed but there is a, a problem which is actually uh, so your concern was well, well established on the fact that uh, we use the two balls to express two different uh, uh, radial diffusivities of the isotropic compartments but this would affect only the volume fractions of these uh, isotropic compartments because as, as i said they are linearly dependent while the estimations of the others of the other signal fractions uh, would not be degenerate because we have that directional component that helps us. Uh, therefore, the only thing that we were retaining from that forward model were the streamline, uh, um, the, 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 the signal fractions associated with streamline, which were reliable. But if we wanted to actually do a microstructural study with all those uh, um, with all those weights, therefore, if we wanted to normalize them, this would not have been uh, feasible because the estimation of the two of the volume fractions of the two isotropic compartments would not have been uh, um, would not have been um, reliable. It would, it would it would have been a degenerate. And uh, um, yes, that. Would. So so the let's choice that we did. The, the, sorry, the Talon. Can you move to this uh, part of your presentation with Talon and uh, commit and TBI? Uh, TBI, yes, here. Yeah, so 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 because that's that's detailed in the question in the in the thesis. So why not so specific? Not not here. Uh, yeah, the slide before, but specifically because you did have the option. Why did you not choose just the ball and stick model instead of the ball stick zeppelin with the extracellular compartment? So the extracellular your, your clinical single shell data. So um, well. Because basically, when we use the when we wanted to use commit, we wanted to use some a version of commit that is widely used, which is the one of the tutorial, which I believe is a very nice uh, is a very nice uh, model for a number of reasons. I mean, we just need to to have an estimation of the well, for the way in which commit works, we can provide the specific uh, the, 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 the FODF peaks to encode the, um, the extracellular compartment. So it just worked uh, out of the box with the default parameters for what we needed, which was only the streamline weights. But, uh, but definitely uh, it would have been, uh, th there is a whole set of parameters that can be exploited and the choice of the multi-compartment model in the microstructure informed tractography framework is a critical choice that uh, I would actually like to see explored uh, sooner or later at the moment. I will do it or someone else, someone else but yeah, I think it would be very important to investigate because in my experience it has a tremendous impact on both on the weights but also on this the non-zero weights the zero weighted uh, streamlines but also also on the root mean squared error out of the the the, the process and yeah and I, also, I, I bet you that your priors that you do fixed because we're big users of the human connectome project data, which is very high quality and you know healthy young adults. It's all PhD students of 25, 30 years old with healthy white matter. And I challenge you to look at the actual response functions of a disease group, your TBI group, an Alzheimer's disease group or something, and you'll, you'll be surprised that your three times 10 to the negative three isotropic CSF compartment is wrong it's badly set and that your intracellular volume fraction at 1.7 times 10 to the negative three that doesn't work either um and and i know that because i actually do look at that a lot so uh, i would really encourage you if you're ever going to apply this again you have to manually tune these priors because otherwise they just don't fit your data yeah, definitely some model selection would be critical on this point of view because uh, it is what would help like uh, explore a, a range of models uh, and actually use for our analysis the one that uh, that is better that better fits uh, our data so i i agree with your consideration on this thank you very much and the next slide can you show me again the next slide i was a bit surprised maybe you want to comment and um no next slide the results yeah, this one. So according to this, the density of a human connectome 
subject is about 50% here, correct? Yeah, around. So again, I, challenge, I, I don't want to focus on the nitty picky details, but just because Sam Delorier is on the call and he has all this HTTP data structure function and he correlates structural connectome of his database, there's something peculiar here because with probabilistic tracking that you do very aggressive tractography with MR tricks uh, and with the atlas you're choosing, with the way you're using a radial search to build your connectome, I just don't see this in my data. Honestly, Matteo, this number is around 70, 80%. Yes. So, so that makes me wonder about the pipeline and the way you did your quality assurance and quality control. And again, that's something I stress a lot in my lab and my students because very often modelers and computer scientists don't look at data. They, they, they just process and they don't look at tractograms. They don't look at outputs. And so, so it's not a critique. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit challenging that, but okay, that's, I, I, I trust your data, but I would like to know what kind of QC and quality assurance and quality control that was done when you do these experiments. I have a, I don't have a, a sure answer answer about uh, about this, but one of the factors that could have affected this is uh, here because uh, when we used the Daisy Kilimi Atlas, uh, we used the whole Free Surfer, the whole volume that comes out of Free Surfer, which has eighty six. Uh, different uh, regions and not uh, uh, 68 as usual. And then we discarded the streamlines that uh, ended uh, uh, outside of the 60, 68 cortical regions. So definitely there is uh, something like 20 regions more than we expect uh, that could drive uh, this difference that you see. Uh, because then the difference in density goes with the square of the node of the empty nodes that you add. So Definitely, there is this factor that we should have done is this better. We, sh we should have uh, discarded the, these nodes from the connectum. But um, yes, it's. Uh... Did you ever open a tractogram? Yes, yes, yes. We did. In the last uh, we did. Three years, yes, did yes, absolutely. Yes. Specifically for this uh, for this uh, experiment, we looked at data. We did. Uh, we actually redid. Uh, uh, commit twice uh, because at the first time uh, it converged uh, with a few iterations and uh, looking at the tractograms we saw that we didn't like what we got so we increased the number uh, of iterations so definitely uh, we looked uh, at our data uh, but I, I will be happy to double check it I, I, I still have the, the TR case input and output so I, I can check that. Well, I'd be curious to see if these numbers fit with what uh, Samuel is seeing in his recent processing. Just to just, because in, in what I see is you got connectomes that are full, full, full. They're 80% full. And then commit one and talent and commit two and all these filtering then really have a big impact. And they, they do bring it down to 50%. But you start very dense. Or, or you ran deterministic tracking or something that, that's a, a bit less aggressive than you think you did. No, I did probabilistic for this experiment. Anyway. All right, so on to the Talon with fMRI. Um, so a little bit like um, Jean-Philippe, I think this, this is a, it's a nice preliminary uh, sexy idea. I think it's, it's, it's worth ex investigating. I like, I like the framework to start looking at it. Um, my question is more uh, for the future. Suppose you would want to include indirect functional connectivity or second order or third order connections. Um, do you have a, a theoretical or a mathematical idea on how you could integrate this in the formulation here? Yes, so thank you for your question because this uh, lets me highlight one aspect that I did not, did not have time to, to go into details. Because basically, so what we did uh, with first, for example, the first version of, uh, of commit was uh, to have a certain sparsity in the space, in the space of, of streamlines. Then commit two does this wonderful job at imposing priors that go at edge level. While uh, with this kind of framework, if we substitute this functional correlation 
with any type of network based prior which can be for instance also the fact that uh, we have a motor system we have a visual system that we want to hard code there you know we know that these are healthy people therefore we want somehow to promote the existence of these kind of networks we just need to straightforwardly plug in these uh, these networks into the model and uh, and create these contrasts somehow uh, this is a uh, the third level of, of priors that we can include because so as I said commit one only at the similar level commit two with bundles and commit three priors at network level so definitely modeling second order or third order connections could be done uh, by a careful design of the type of uh, let's call it functional connectome that we put in there here we did uh, in our experiment we did a very naive choice by choosing the person's correlation, just the person's correlation between time series, we actually excluded the negative correlations for a number of reasons. For, but apart from the technical details of, on this, um, we did a naive choice that can be substantially improved to take into account, for example, the dynamics uh, of the network by we, we explored the possibility of uh, including the maximum sliding window correlation between the time series. The, in the dynamic functional connectome uh, paradigm. And uh, definitely this would be uh, the place where we could include a second, third order connections or any other, any other network prior, prior at level of network. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, but, and this is not my field at all, but am I wrong or I've seen this in the past, but is it possible that if you take orders of the matrix like if you square it or if you take it to the power of three you're it actually has a nice mathematical link with second order and third order or nth order connections did you did you see this or read this somewhere yeah definitely so when we take uh, a functional community matrix uh, so depending on how we define it but basically it's a transition matrix somehow between states uh, in a markov chain more or less so Definitely multiplying this matrix uh, with itself several times gives uh, second, third, third order. And uh, these numbers, so for example, the square of the matrix would account only for second order interactions because as input, you get uh, a set of states. So in particular, you can have uh, a vector of all zeros except one. So we have a functioning, a functional activation somewhere. If you multiply this with the square of the functional, of the functional matrix, uh, what you get is where you are two steps after not only one. So to encapsulate all the information about direct uh, second order and third order connections, we would need to, to somehow include all these, uh, uh, these aspects together. But yes, that's, uh, a, that's in my opinion, the correct way to, to start uh, uh, including second and third and nth order uh, functional connections. Cool. Thanks. All right, on to the last part about uh, brain alignment, um, which uh, so I see I see where you and I, I like your experiments and the way you you used your approach to evaluate different parcellations in a sense. Um, but if we take a step back and you're trying to, yeah, you're trying to motivate it somehow or, or convince me, Max, stop using standard registration or. Uh, you know, image-based registration or streamline-based registration, you should really start looking at graph-based alignment to study in your studies. Um, is that a motivation or we're just not there yet? Or it, so that's right, sell it to me, sell it again to me. Okay, so uh, depending on the application that you want to have. So if you want to just to register brains in general, uh, I would suggest that you take into account what we did and you expand it by including also the streamline registration, the bundle registration. I know that you did some wonderful works uh, with uh, uh, Eleftherium Peripalidis also on, this, uh, on these topics. Uh, I mean, this is a very expandable, um, expandable framework where we establish uh, a relation between nodes of the network. So, 
the relation between the nodes of the network, as we showed in the other contributions of this thesis, can come from the streamer bundles and can come from the pure topology. If you want to look just at the pure topology, then probably these, uh, uh, well, not probably, actually, I'm, I would strongly suggest uh, to take into account the possibility to employ WL aligning. But if you want to study uh, brains in general, I would uh, agree that uh, we probably need uh, to expand it. Uh, and to expand it, we just need to make this vector longer and, make, and, and put more information at the end of this vector where we want to align it. Um, to expand it to before using it in, in the daily practice. But this technique, uh, this was the spirit of, this, of designing this technique was not to provide the universal way to align uh, network, to align connectoms, brain, brain networks. It was to provide a way to find alignments that rely uniquely on the edges of the connectoms and their ways on the, on the topology of this network. And uh, therefore, the goal of this experiment and this technique is different from the goal of registration in general. So I would not, uh, I would not consider the two to be uh, alternative, uh, but more complementary. Yeah, and, and if one of your conclusions is that if you have lower number of parcels, this, this alignment works best, better. Yes. Which is... <laughs> Not surprising, but a bit disappointing at the same time, right? Because I would think that we're dreaming of the day that we don't need parcellation anymore. That, you know, the individual cortex, the individual folding and the individual little triangles of each person's mesh could serve as its, you know, highest resolution parcellation in a sense. And, and so can you help me, uh, well, yeah, can you answer this question or this or comment on this thing or correct me if I'm not thinking at it right? No, you're definitely on the right path, in my opinion, and, uh, because uh, definitely there is this, uh, I don't know if it is a person of dimensionality, because it's but it certainly is uh, a pity, because uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, when we go up with the number of parcels, we go low with the alignability. And we have actually, there is actually evidence that this happens all the times with signature-based alignments. So there is a methodological limitation in this, uh, uh, from this point of view. But so taking into account these resolution differences, so we see that basically after 300 parcels, the 300 parcels, we basically uh, factor. So here we are using the jacket index ratio, which factors out uh, the complexity of the problem related to the number of parcels. And basically we see that we perform more or less all the same after 300. Uh, but uh, um, definitely using these uh, mesh-based strategies, uh, it is something something that has uh, been done already by Guillermo, Guillermo Gachardo in uh, his uh, optimal transport framework for finding correspondences between parcels. So the parcel matching problem. And basically that's what it does. It does uh, this massive seeding from uh, vertices uh, of the um, of the mesh and it looks uh, at where it goes it builds these connectivity fingerprints that are very long because they are as long as the um, as the number of points that we have in the mesh and then it tries to, to use this as a as an alignment technique and it gets wonderful results because the technique of Guillermo gets far higher than the 90 percent uh, alignment so if we just look uh, at the performance, at the general performance of uh, parcel matching, uh, I mean, we certainly have to solve the problem of seeding more streamlines uh, in correspondence with uh, the amount of parcels that you have uh, that you are considering in the atlas, and uh, basically to, to to disentangle this uh, uh, this problem of signal noise ratio in the in the in, in the connectivity matrix because. The, the critical factor here, factor here is, is that uh, we normalize our connectivity matrix to be able to compare them. And uh, by normalizing, if we are normalizing the same amount of values, so the same volume over a higher number of nodes, and actually the square of the number of nodes, then what we get is, uh, is simply that, uh, that we have lower signal at, this, at the same noise, more or less. So 
definitely there is something that we can do better from this point of view in our experiment, but we have a way to somehow factor it out, which is this graph jacket index, this jacket index ratio. And, uh, and, and I mean, uh, it's just the beginning also of these techniques. Oh, right? yeah. So there, there might, yeah, of course, there's lots to be improved. Absolutely. Okay, final question. Uh, now taking a step back and you have your whole thesis um, and, and you come as a postdoc in my lab and you start a new connectomics project on clinical data, football players with traumatic brain injuries in Sherbrooke. Uh, describe to me your connectomics pipeline today. Today. So February 20th, what are we? February 22nd, 2021. With the exist, with everything we have and you have, what do you do? Yeah, what do you do? Okay, so uh, I will keep pre-processing probably because I'm not a super expert on that. I will ask for some help from someone uh, that knows better than me how to pre-process this kind of data. But uh, when I have the pre-processed data, I would start first uh, connectomic uh, uh, connectomic pipelines to start uh, with uh, the local modeling. And I would do, depending on the type of data that we have in the Shell multi shell, I would do the best uh, as I can do in terms of constraint spherical deconvolution to find uh, the fiber orientations. And uh, then uh, about the tractography, I would have a number of choices to be made, but in general, I would tend to use uh, 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 a probabilistic tractography, even if. Uh, probably it would be better to, to do both a deterministic and probabilistic uh, tractography and do both the analysis to see uh, how, how this go. Um, but yeah, once I do my probabilistic tractography seeding from the gray matter white matter interface, I would, uh, I would employ a, a, part of, a, a particle filtering, uh, a particle filtering tractography, which is certainly the best uh, that we have in terms of uh, usability in a wide, uh, uh, in, a, in a big cohort of subjects uh, and still getting some specificity. And then, uh, uh, and then I would build, uh, build my, uh, my parcellation according to, well, the Desigan Atlas, because here I showed, uh, I showed that it is the one that uh, uh, performs better in, the, in terms of uh, um, robustness of the topology. And the streamline assignment, as I said before, I would do that uh, doing this uh, local search, uh, doing it uh, either with respect to the mesh, the cortical mesh, or uh, with respect to the, um, as I said, the, uh, to the volume that they get out of the surfer, for example. Uh, well, that would be a choice of, uh, uh, that would depend on the type of data that I have, but certainly doing it with respect to the mesh, it's very interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's actually the correct way to do that. As far as meshes are concerned, uh, I would probably, so I, I'm not sure, since I would be in your lab, I would, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Etienne some help uh, to, to do this mesh morphing that does uh, surface enhanced tractography to properly assess uh, the tractography within the gyri, uh, since I have the meshes. And uh, so at the end, yes, that's uh, how I will, I will build the tractography after doing the filtering. So the filtering step, um, I am a big fan of the volume fraction model because uh, you don't need to rely on the uh, microstructure, mo on a multi-compartment model that you have to justify your choices instead of sticks, zeppelins, balls, the diffusivities, and this and that. The volume fraction model, uh, is simpler from the point of view of tractography filtering. And uh, it has the drawback that it requires to estimate this volume fraction, but uh, uh, I have uh, a new technique that uh, one hour ago I showed uh, all of you to estimate, uh, to, to, get, to get a better estimate of the volume fractions. So I would hopefully, if I have the data that support this kind of experiment, I will use this. Otherwise, uh, I can use a strategy that is close to the one that employs uh, SIF2 to compute the volume fractions, so just to use the volumes uh, of the FODFs. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I would do the filtering and the regularization that I would do 
assuming that I don't have uh, any functional information, and even if, even if I had uh, if I had it, I would be very curious to use it uh, to test my to test my my method. But still, we don't have uh, empirical evidence that it works. So I will stick uh, to a commit to like uh, uh, regularization where we have uh, um, bundle sparsity, so sparsity in the space of bundles. And uh, yes, I would get a connecting uh, out of it. What do you put in the matrix? What number do you put in the matrix? I put I would do the weighted connectum using the uh, the sum of the weights that I got out of the filtering techniques for each pair of edges, and then since I have to do this population study, I would uh, divide the, the matrix by the sum of its entries to normalize uh, to normalize the connectum. Uh, notice that this normalization, if we don't do tractography filtering does not usually do anything because uh, I would divide uh, all the connectors by the same number, which is the number of streamlines. Oh ah, yeah, about the number of streamlines, uh, I don't have a clear answer, but I see that the trend is to stay above the million and uh, below the 10 millions. And uh, in your comments in the thesis, you wrote that uh, you have experiments that uh, uh, you did in your, with, your, with the students and postdocs in your lab where you see that it doesn't make a big difference after a certain number from the atomic point of view. I would be eager to, uh, to do a statistical analysis on that. And, uh, but yes, I would probably employ two or five million streamlines depending on how many subjects we have and how much computational effort we can afford. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, to you. Thanks for your answers, Mathieu. Thanks okay. to you Thank for you your review. Much. Thank you very much, Maxime. So uh, next, I will give uh, the, the parole at uh, Ragini Verma from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Hi, Matteo. Hello. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Rashid, for inviting me to be part of it, and Theo for helping me through all these um, timing differences. Um, so anyways, um, coming to your thesis, they are, you know, almost all the questions you want to be asked at this stage are asked. So, so take mine maybe as uh, somewhat with a pinch of salt, uh, maybe sometimes with a bottle of salt, there might be a discussion on religion more than anything else. But starting off, um, I will ask you questions more from a clinical flavor and more question as to where your stuff would fit in in the clinic. So if you go to your first part of your thesis, which was the multi-compartment modeling, if you look at, if you want to make a very simplistic model of the brain, what happens in a pathological brain is that gunk gets added to the brain. If it's TBI, it would be the, the mess that the brain creates in order to clean up breakages or, or not. There would be swelling. So all of it actually comes down to um, underlying free water. There would be a changed compartment, which could be edema of some form. It could either be cancerous cells, it could be regular edema, but it's basically just another compartment which has a slightly different diffusion properties. And then there is the underlying tissue, which may or may not change. Um, so how would your model fit into this or how would you modify your model to have, let's say, at least two fiber compartments. Um, and it will have to be able to distinguish between CSF, because as Max said, your all your assumptions on S0 and all that will change uh, because, and you basically don't have ground truth, so to speak, unless and until you do have a healthy control somewhere sitting because the CSF itself is changed in the patient, right? So you don't have true ground truth of the ventricles either. But assuming that you have 
CSF from the ventricles. You have, you have CSF from the brain, which could be changed all over in something like TBI. And then you have the multi-compartment modeling of the fibers itself. So how would you handle that? Okay, so first of all, thanks for your uh, question. It has a very interesting flavor because it allows me to, to underline first of that uh, to model multiple fibers in general, so more complex fiber configurations, uh, we just need uh, a sufficient amount uh, of gradient directions uh, and model basically a spherical harmonic representation of the underlying FDF. For as far as the um, intra and extracellular compartment are, are concerned. Then to go into the differences uh, that are due to the, to the pathology in terms of isotropic compartments, we can add more, uh, uh, more isotropic compartments here that have different uh, as zeros, but the challenge at that point uh, would be to estimate these as zeros correctly for each type of isotropy that we want to, uh, that we want to include in the model. So I guess that the, if I had to, if I had to give you a safe answer that uh, will not be incorrect, it would be acquire multi-echo data and then encode the multi-echo component uh, in front of its compartment, and then just uh, do uh, and does, and then just estimate together the T2 time of the um, of each compartment together with the volume fractions. But this would probably require uh, a more significant effort in, in terms of uh, acquisition design. And in general, as the design of experiment would change from several points of view, several points of view. So uh, I would simply say that uh, if you have uh, indication that the S0 of all the isotropic compartments uh, is similar or you can find a heuristic behind that, because uh, here we are, so also in my experiment, these, these three tissues are all heuristics. So at the end, we, we all boil down to that. We all, we all end up doing heuristics on these as zeros. And uh, definitely to, you, to do your patients versus control study, I would try first uh, to do, for example, to, to acquire some, uh, to do some relaxometry study to understand the uh, as zero differences, and then encode this kind of information into the multi-compartment model. Uh, because uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, what you're proposing is multi-compartment models for tissues uh, on which we don't have uh, a whole range. Uh, where we, don't, we don't really understand completely what are the zero differences between these tissues, or at least we cannot disentangle it uh, univocally. In a yeah. way, it works uh, for uh, every single subject and the, and the populations. Right. So, but assuming, assuming you don't have Santa Claus who will give you this ability to acquire data and you have hardcore lots of data. So suppose you say the track TBI data set, which has a naughty acquisition on it, right? What can you do knowing that you have? So how would you reverse engineer this so that you know you have a naughty acquisition, which is crucial? What is the best that you can do in the data and how much would you trust it? So with two shells, uh, I would uh, pre-estimate uh, the uh, the FODFs uh, in such a way that we can hard code it into this. Uh, for example, with the constraints by the catheter evolution, and then I would encode uh, the C, the, the S zeros of the IC and the C as the zeros of the white matter that we can estimate uh, to do see do. Uh, so with two shells, so we can distinguish basically two S zeros. And uh, that would be my prior that I have two S zeros with different, uh, um, oh, sorry, two S zeros, one for the white matter and one for the, for all the isotropic compartments. And in that way, the volume fraction of each isotropic compartment will be rescaled somehow according to the same prior. So, uh, this is obviously not uh, perfectly correct, but uh, it is what we can do with two shells, for example. And uh, that's what uh, I would do. Okay. Um, I, hope it, I hope this answers the question. Uh, yes, I think 
yes, I I think you would probably need to think a lot more when you actually get the data. But yes, it gets you started thinking in the right direction, so to speak. Um, now, coming to your part about the TBI patients and HCP data, I echo um, uh, Max's sentiment. I know what was done in the clinical data because we did the processing of that, right? I worry that your density in the HCP is so low uh, that the processing pipeline is off. So as you know, before you graduate into the next lab, I would suggest that you spend some time figuring out processing pipelines. Um, it affects your connectomes like nothing else in this whole wide world. And even in the TBI, we have had to change the processing pipeline, I think a record number of 17 times before, because every time you do, you can find a fundamental flaw in how uh, things would be affected if one part of the brain is off and the other part of the brain is healthy, or if you assume that probabilistic tracking will overly track wherever it can. So it might show an increased connectivity if it's an unhealthy tissue versus that won't show up in healthy. However, the low density in HCP gets me worried. It's lower than our 30 direction, very badly acquired data of patients. So it gets me a little bit worried there. Um, the fact that there is absolutely no difference is too good to be true. Um, and we've seen that in our other data that SIFT and commit make a huge difference. So you commented a little bit, and that's there in your paper too, about using SIFT and comment carefully on clinical data, uh, which is a good thing to do. But what would you suggest are the next steps? How do you attack it? Do you ever do it in clinical data? So um, I will answer first your second question and then I will get back to your uh, comment, to your first comment. So in the, to include the uh, tractorial filtering in, in clinical practice, uh, well, it, I'm sorry to say that it, I don't think it's ready to be included uh, without, uh, that's the conclusion of our paper in the end that uh, we need extra care because uh, there are a number of choices that we have to do in the design of the, of the tractor filtering as I showed uh, in the presentation before. But definitely the direction where I would look into would be to probably to concatenate uh, multiple, uh, um, multiple factor uh, uh, filtering techniques to get the best out of each of them. Because I think uh, our commit uh, uh, allows to get the zeros. So allows to get uh, to eliminate the single streamlines or the, or the bundles in the case of commit two. But then I, I, I really like also how SIFT2 was, a, in SIFT2 they were able to design a very high resolution forward model that takes into account the contribution of each streamline to the specific load, lobe of the FODF, not just to the volume fraction in general. So probably uh, the, I would do a first step where I eliminate streamlines that do not explain the, dat uh, the data in a meaning meaningful way. And then either I would just keep that and do uh, some uh, streamline count on the remaining streamlines because uh, I have some troubles uh, understanding what it means to have a connectome uh, in, in the clinical context. I have some troubles uh, understanding what it means to define the edge weights according to the signal fraction or the volume fraction if we correct them um, of each single streamline. So I have some troubles on that. Uh, otherwise, I would do, as I said, a second step where I do uh, some uh, volume, I, 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 do, I use the volume fraction model to, um, to assign a coefficient that I can actually read with a biophysical and uh, biological interpretation, like the volume fraction model, uh, where, I, where I have the uh, streamline coefficients uh, that are 
the uh, mean cross-sectional area of the streamline across its length. Therefore, that would be something that is more credible somehow as a prior to include in our definition of the weighted connectron because uh, what we are talking about uh, in structural connectivity is connect connection strength. And I expect that if I have uh, a lot of axons that have uh, a big cross-sectional area, I expect to have a stronger connection somehow. Uh, and on the contrary, if I have a uh, few streamlines with uh, a, a little, uh, a small cross-sectional area, I would expect it, I would associate it uh, to a bundle, to a streamline bundle that has uh, a low, uh, low connect, that has low, that shows low, low axonal connectivity. Somehow. So definitely, um, I would, uh, carefully try to understand how this pipeline uh, works uh, with the data and probably I would employ it uh, in this way. Going back to your comment about the HCP database, the HCP, the HCP data, um, I will go back to the results that we got. I will do some Q and A on that after the defense. Uh, I will look at the, at the, at the tractograph that we get uh, out of the filtering process to check uh, what we see makes sense. Um, I think I also have the specific code that I ran for uh, these experiments, so I can look at that. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I agree that uh, this job uh, is all about procedures in the end. We have to find the right procedure that we have to possibly get validated by the healthcare institutions somehow. and. Uh, and, it's, and it is important to, to, to find the optimal procedure. I have to be honest, uh, we used uh, a very general pipeline that uh, adapts to a lot of data sets. So we could have done much better on that side. Definitely, uh, now that I know more about these things, uh, I would probably adapt my pipeline more to the to the kind of data sets uh, data set that we have this analysis is already all done for you. yeah i also think no thank you but i also think that when you were doing your sift and comet the kind of models you fitted are very important for clinical data i think it is very forgiving on healthy data but it's not that forgiving when you have to work on pathological data. So I would keep that in mind in case you do run over and start processing Max's data on football players. Um, the final set of questions are on the last two parts of your work, but they're mostly combined. Um, that's a fascinating number and we have something called matching accuracy that we work on, which is about matching two different connectomes. So it's something similar to the stuff, again, using graph matching. So it's something similar, but I would think that similarity, the increased similarity between two people is actually not a good thing you want, there is immense amount of variability between two human beings. So would you not think, number one, that higher parcellation showing you less similarity is a good thing, which means that it was able to capture the variability across people. Two, when you try and use this, I'm assuming in the future, you will try to use this in combination with your structure function thing. The fact that someone is improving in function does not mean that their brains are structurally becoming similar to healthy controls. The brain might change very, so structural plasticity and functional plasticity are completely different. Functional means that the brain knows that Suppose it gets hit on the head, it needs to be able to pick up a cell phone off the table. The structural means that somehow your roads are being repaved in a certain way. Sometimes new roads have to be created. Sometimes the old roads have to be repaved. 
so that you get the same function. So function defines the goal that structure works up to. So there is a chance that the brain would never look similar to the healthy control, but the function will be restored. So with both of this in mind, how would you suggest combining structure and function? Because most things that I have seen assume that both will proceed in the same direction. So um, let me understand if I understood correctly your question. Uh, what you're asking is uh, how I would combine the structural and function information to, uh, in, in the context of this problem that I'm... Uh, that no, I'm just talking? let's talk about structure and function combination the way in general, in general. general, right? in general. Yeah. In general, consuming, assuming that connectivity and microstructure may change differently over time. So, and you're, you talk about incorporating function into it, about microstructure, but one may pull it in one direction and the other may be in the, in the other direction, but your function is always in the same direction. It has to either improve or decrease, right? It's that one. So, how do you resolve something like that? Or how do you incorporate that into your model? So uh, in general, uh, when I design, uh, when, I, when I in the design of the pipeline, if I were doing structural connectivity estimation using also functional, uh, I would probably take into account the, the kind of prior that we were discussing before also with, uh, with Maxima, where we have the second, third order interactions to take into account either in the filtering process or in more complex uh, situations uh, where we are actively taking into account the uh, sort of neural mass model based on the structure that I build with tractography, let's say. Uh, I hope it doesn't exist because it's very complicated from mathematical point of view, but that's the spirit. Uh, but yeah, in general, uh, um, the fact that uh, the structure always has to work, the reorganization of the structure the, or the function, the reorganization of the farm of the function in case of pathology is the kind of prior that I'm happy to see when I use, uh, when I do structure, because somehow it gives uh, the invariant that I want to explain with the structure. And that is something that uh, sort of is the reliable thing that I want to observe with the structure. Because uh, in the end, as you said, if I want my structural network to be able to explain the action of picking up the phone, uh, or in general, to, to, to support in any case, uh, the functioning as it is. So that's the one direction where uh, this, the function will pull the structure. On the contrary, uh, we may have uh, some, uh, uh, so explaining function using the structure, uh, this uh, has, a yeah, as you said, this would give uh, some limitations because uh, apart from all the limitations of, uh, of tractography itself and tractography filtering uh, in general, uh, there's the fact that uh, this direction from structure to function is still not completely understood. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure I will have uh, one specific strategy to follow in uh, understanding function using structure. Uh, because the variety of models that has been proposed uh, is huge uh, and uh, none of them has established them as the real winner. So I guess I would probably do some model selection to, to, to understand what, what's better to do, but I don't have uh, a, unique, a unique answer to the problem of uh, explaining function using the structure yet. While for explaining structure, including functional priors, we have a very simple example in water presenting in thesis and also in other models. Uh, there is a, actually a, an article in 2018 of uh, Christophe Lenglet that does a very long list of ways to include function and structure of explaining structure using functional information. Uh, so yes, definitely there is, so there is no symmetry in how we include one into the other. And I'm not sure I answered what is uh, your question, but uh, definitely the, the direction where I would look is uh, into how this uh, asymmetry exhibits itself uh, into the two different uh, networks. 
the structure and the function. About the first question, uh, which is- uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so concerning the fact that the, the higher number of parcels, uh, basically the higher the subject specificity, so the lower the similarity, this is certainly a possibility that uh, we could uh, somehow disentangle with some better design of the experiment, uh, and in particular by employing uh, the uh, uh, multi-resolution parcellation and uh, aligning parcellations at different resolutions, which cannot be done with the technique as it is, but uh, we can certainly think of a way to do that. Because, uh, so I will do it this way, because if I have, for example, the, the Gachardo parcellation at 15 different resolutions, and I get my connectons at each of these resolutions. Um, I want to I want to be sure that uh, the one node in a uh, very low resolution parcellation is a is uh, mapped onto nodes that are in the that are segmentations of the big node somehow in the higher resolution, and uh, this would allow us uh, to understand. If the subject, if the alignability is actually what we expect it to be and what we assume it to be in the experiment or not. Because if we are able to map the, um, if we are actually able to map a node into its smaller components, this means, uh, uh, give me a second and I don't want to pick this wrong. This means uh, that. Uh, we have uh, the correct alignment. So we have the subject specificity because when we observe a higher number of parcellations in our experiments, we see that it is uh, less alignable. But if I am alignable with myself across resolutions, this means that it is a, a problem of the parcellation itself for the cohort, not for myself. Okay. I'm not sure I was clear. Uh, clear enough, but it's okay. We've had a long conversation. We can take this offline. I, I would okay. like to, yeah. So I, I just wanted you to think about these aspects at least because sometimes we get uh, mired into the beauty of math and forget that they need to have an application in the outside world. So just as, a, as, a comp, as something you could look into further, it is something which Max said, which is what about registration? And you could definitely, I know you didn't think of it from the perspective of registration, but especially diseases like brain tumors or anything that has a very large focal abnormality in the brain, almost every kind of intensity-based registration fails on it. So if you could have a connectivity based prior on it in a certain way, I think anything which takes into account a change topology will really help in registration and registration of large lesioned brains is still a very open problem. People say they've solved it, but that's complete and utter crap. When you actually do it on real data, you have to do it manually. So that is something you could look into as your fine, you know, in later, if you ever want to follow up on your graph based matching. But anyways, I'd like to congratulate you on great work and thank you for tolerating my questions. Thanks to you. It was a great pleasure also to collaborate with you and uh, your, uh, your colleagues, uh, Du Parker and uh, Aziz uh, and, uh, and you and John Kim also in our projects, it's, it's been a great pleasure. And thanks for today and for taking the time to read the thesis. Thank you. Okay, now I will pass the word to Alfred Advander. Alfred? Alfred? <laughs> yeah, we are not seeing you, but we are hearing you. Ah. Uh, 
Are you people hearing, Alfred? I'm not. No, sure. no, no, no. We well, I'm no. hearing. Well, I'm not hearing either, Alfred. I'm hearing mic noises, but not Alfred. Not Alfred's voice. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I cannot hear you. Ah, oh, he's here. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait, but some of my, I only see a black screen. <laughs> um, let me. Let me try to reconnect. No, but that's fine. We are hearing you now, and we are yes, seeing you. I, I, I cannot see anything. Ah. <laughs> um, but uh, well, maybe let's do it. Let's if, do it you, if you want some time, I can pass the word to, to someone else. The, the time you you recover your. Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. So. Yeah. Okay. So then I, I will give uh, the the word to uh, to Samuel Delorier Gautier. Uh, Sam? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yes, obviously I was a, a, a co-supervisor, co Matteo, so I obviously know the work that you did. So I simply want to say, Matteo, that it's been a pleasure working with you for the past three, three years. Um, I do remember the first time you walked into my office and we had a very nice discussion on tractogram filtering and optimization problem on uh, information flow, because I was working on that at the moment. Um, and at that moment, we set out, um, uh, we laid out a plan of what we would do for your PhD for the next three years. Yeah. And uh, I mean, what ended up happening in practice was very, very different from this, right? We had, we had a very clear idea on factor on filtering. And in the end, you worked on a, on a range of topics that you very nicely presented today. Um, and every time we discuss this, I get a sense that, uh, not regret, but you're, you feel like you should have done it. Uh, and I want to say that uh, uh, you shouldn't feel that way because what you did produce is very, very nice work um, and you should be proud of it. And I'm very proud of the work that you did. So congratulations on the work itself um, and also the presentation today because you showed you can argue um, your topics very well and you know you know what you're talking about basically. Thank you very much, Sam. I, I recall it uh, as it's yesterday, that conversation in your office. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you said, uh, we go through it sometimes and we laugh about it. Uh, fortunately, we laugh. Like we built uh, we built some quite some work in the years. Uh, absolutely, without you, this would be probably one tenth of what it is. And uh, no, seriously, it's been a great pleasure, a honor, and uh, your support was. Uh, one of the things without which this thesis would not exist. And uh, thanks for remarking that uh, we did something out of that topic because sometimes uh, I still scratch my head thinking that. Yeah. So in classic <laughs> Matteo style, not taking enough credit for your own work. <laughs> so, uh, so, I'm, so obviously I know the work, so I'm only gonna ask uh, on the perspectives because that's the more interesting part to me. Uh, you know, you, now you're the expert on the domain and like to see where you see this going forward. Um, and so in your perspective, you had one particular line where you, you talked about a, um, a forward model of simultaneous structure and function, right? Because we do have certain models that are uh, able to generate function like TVB and stuff like that, that generate either fMRI or EG or MEG. Um, and we do have some phantoms, uh, including the, the lab at EPFL, uh, working on simulations of um, structural uh, data from connectivity. Um, and so how do you see those two things coming together? And it's an open-ended open question, right? This is just how you would see it. So how would you go about building a simulator that simulates both structure and function? And importantly, how would you validate this, right? Because we already have problems with validating diffusion models uh, and then you're adding function to the mix. So what would be your strategy on something like this? Well, uh, so first of all, um, about defining the whole model of structure and function together, I would start with a simple experiment where I stitch together, I build a big optimization problem where I stitch together fitting terms that fit function and structure at the same time. I would probably need to do some tuning in how much one weights with respect to the other, but that's definitely the simple experiment that we could do to explain structure and function at the same time how we build uh, uh, in a practical way, the structural or the functional uh, fitting terms. That's uh, up for discussion. 
certainly for building the structural part, we can use uh, what you do with your uh, connectivity for the maximum entropy of means somehow, I mean, same spirit, not exactly the same probably, but certainly in that direction. And uh, on the structural side, we have all these wonderful tractography filtering uh, parts where we, because the game here is to transport the problem of mapping structure to function towards the problem of using the information that comes from the actual connectivity that we can estimate with tractography, using it uh, to transport the function somehow here and there around the cortex. And that's exactly what the uh, forward models of EEG and MEG do and uh, from the function side. And that's what tractography filtering does, for example, with the model that we, with the regularization term that we presented in the thesis today. I mean, this duality would need to be played both in the, in the part of the fitting terms of the, of the big problem and in the part of the regularization. So including priors and fitting data at the same time. It would be a huge problem uh, from the computational point of view um, because like, already tractography filtering is complex as we all know. And I say that uh, with uh, the head that does like this. Uh, but um, definitely we can find the tricks to, to make it easier. Or we can just wait uh, that three cluster finishes its computation. At the end, uh, this is, uh, these are, we are lucky enough uh, to do uh, methods uh, in, in our lab to do research uh, into the methods uh, before they are ready to be uh, deployed uh, into, the, into the daily pra practice of clinics. So, for the first experiments, we could probably afford a slow method. Uh, but yeah, definitely we would need to, to work a lot into weighting the contribution in the fitting part and in the, inclusion, in, the, in the inclusion of the priors in the regularization. And probably in a careful design also on the constraints, because if, when we do tractor filtering, as we talked about today, as we talked about it today, the constraints are simple. But when we want to get more complex, probably we will need to do something more uh, specific to the application that we have. Because function, for example, when we model correlation, we do not have no negativity there. I mean, correlation of minus one, how do you explain that with no negativity? So there are there's a number of problems that we will need to talk about. I'd be happy to do it from the next week. Yeah, great. And it's interesting to see from the, the way that you describe it, to, uh, it seems that to you the um, the forward model is intrinsically linked to the possibility of being able to invert it, right? Because you're already talking about constraints and all that, but we could imagine a forward model that's impossible to to invert. That would just generate data, but you can't go back oh, to the yes. model itself. Yes, about uh, yeah, about validation that you asked me about validation. Yeah, we need phantoms. Uh, absolutely, it's urgent for the community. I believe. And I really hope that uh, there's some group somewhere that is developing that, uh, and I don't know that. Otherwise, uh, what I would do um, is uh, use some uh, high resolution, high definition uh, uh, simulation, uh, simulation that uh, technique for diffusion, like uh, uh, the one developed in uh, Jean-Philippe Trans Lab, or uh, if you want to go for something simpler, we would probably use a Firebox, Firefox or Phantomas with all the limitations that, we, that they have, but they are the best that we have. And then for the with the ground truth connectivity that we get out of this, because they are phantoms, so we have it, we will probably need to use some neural mass model like the ones uh, implemented in the virtual brain, etc. But over there, I mean, we tried uh, something, but Without uh, a proper uh, expertise, they can generate data that we want to observe. So, uh, and it, it is not a good thing because they don't generate what we have to observe when we look at the real data. They generate what we want to observe because we like it for the way in which we conceived the formal model. So basically we are cheating. So I would probably ask for some help to someone that is an expert in this type of uh, multi-agent interaction model and, uh, uh, and for a way to couple these two, because there are, yes, there are the uh, multi-agent interactions at the level of connectivity, but then there are the spatial con constraints like cortical, co cortical cortical interactions and everything else. So we need a wide range of competencies and skills 
uh, to to tackle this problem, the, the validation problem. I think it is it is definitely out uh, of the of the visibility range of people that work only in one of these specific problems, like function or structure or neural model. We need to talk to each other. Though. Yeah, I agree. Not an easy problem, and we need to solve this as a community or a fusion of multiple communities. Cool. Thank you for your answer. So that's that's it for me. I'll uh, leave the floor to Theo. Thanks, Theo. Okay, so uh, let's try it again with Alfred. Alfred, now. Yeah, I'm sorry. The the meeting was too long, maybe for my computer also. <laughs> So um, thank you, Matteo, like for this really nice presentation, and I congratulate you. Want to congratulate you again also for this really clear presentation and also the the nice um, way you wrote the manuscript. I just uh, join Max to to um, to congratulate you on this. This is really nice to read through the manuscript. Um, a lot of questions were already. Um, asked and I just wanted to focus on on two points on the more on the um, um, how to how to use what what you developed and in particular I was interested in uh, in this connectivity analysis and filtering like how to get like a better connectome out of it and so you had this uh, if you go on slide 27 um, you did this comparison of uh, the results with different filtering techniques. So this is great. Like, and it's it nicely shows that of course, like the filtering has some effect on 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 the graph-based measures and also on the connectivity um, uh, statistics. But now the, my question was like, is um, um, what kind of connections do you? like or what kind of connections do you remove and are those connections that you lose like in this significant comparison for example if you look at the structural connectivity you have some of this in the upper right and lower left uh, quadrant um, some connections which connects the left and right hemisphere so my question is are those like false positive connections uh, that you detect if you don't filter it and that are gone away. So like, do you like really improve the robustness of the, of the connectome or uh, what kind is are the connections that you remove the typical false positive connections? So the short answer to your question is we don't know, but I will try to motivate better because uh, uh, first of all, we do not know if these are false positives or false positives uh, or true positives or whatever else, because uh, uh, here the differences that we show, the points, uh, the, the points that are marked are just the edges that show differences. So here, for instance, shift two does not show differences in these edges, but we know for a fact that uh, these edges are still there in the connectomes because shift two, shift two does not remove any edge. It reweights it, but it does not remove it. So, uh, this is the reason why I, uh, my answer is uh, definitely uh, we don't know what we remove from this experiment. We may know better from other experiments that we can do on uh, definitely on some uh, synthetic data sets, but as these uh, these experiments are were only uh, only aimed at assessing how the uh, differences uh, were exhibited in different with different uh, filtering techniques so mm -hmm. and uh, well instead of using filtering techniques um well we know that uh, probabilistic tractography well produces false positive connection and often they are like in the connectome they are also expressed as weak connections so one of the approaches which is commonly used in the literature is just to threshold the the, tra the, the, the connectome, like the, the tractographs, that you remove like the weak connections. It's like with the assumption that weak connections are maybe the ones which are the least reproducible and therefore like maybe false connections. Did you um, investigate thresholding here? And like, how does it look like if you would threshold it? 
So I did not investigate the possibility of thresholding these connectomes, uh, mainly because uh, thresholding a connectome implies the choice of a threshold, which is yet another parameter to tune. And also because the, the goal of the experiment was more onto the, the, the filtering techniques that can be summarized uh, with the generalized framework that we defined uh, some, slides, some slides before. Um, but yes, definitely, especially in the case of SIFT2, where uh, streamlines uh, may not be zero, but they may be assigned to a coefficient uh, that is incredibly low. And in particular, the edge, uh, uh, the edge weights that come out of those, uh, of those streamlines could, be, uh, could have a very low weight. In that context, uh, thresholding could help, and uh, it would help uh, probably, and I say probably because I expect it from theory, but I don't have empirical evidence. It would have an effect similar to commit, uh, uh, plain commit, so without uh, complex or sophisticated regularizations when uh, done with the volume fraction model. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, that's, uh, that's what I would expect to see, but we did not look into that. It's definitely a very interesting question to investigate how these connectons survive, uh, how the differences showed by these types of connectons survive when thresholding is applied. But yes, we did not look, it, look, it, not look into that. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I think that uh, the about the first comment that, uh, that you made, uh, we did not look at what are the labels of the nodes connected by the edges uh, that, connect, that, uh, that show differences between, uh, um, between patients and controls. So definitely, I'm not able to give you an answer to your, to your first question about uh, whether I know or not uh, what type of connection I'm, uh, what is the type of connection that is uh, involved in this type of problem. Definitely, I can see from these plots that there are some uh, inter-hemispheric connections that are involved in the, in the, in the analysis, but that's, uh, as far as I can go at the moment, unfortunately. But uh, that's another thing that would be and will be very interesting to. Uh, and in, in, in this comparison between like commit and shift to shift two, did you also include uh, not here in this study, but in a in a, like in a side study also the subcortical connections like the projection fibers to the thalamus uh, caudate nucleus, uh, which are part of like the not the association fibers, but the projection fiber system, which is relevant also in the in the whole network analysis. So how does it does it work as good to sift to and commit for those um, connections? We included them in the study, I believe. Uh, let me so ah, uh, we so I don't remember if we had a segmentation of the peduncle. Uh, so specifically about projection fibers, uh, uh, I'm not sure that we have them, but definitely to subcortical between uh, uh, the cortical and subcortical structure, we have the connections. I would need uh, to, to look at uh, to look back at the data to to remember if we had a segmentation of the example to get the projection fibers. And um, talking about the similarity of the. Um, of the topology, so I like this this approach to like like this basic assumption that like in a healthy population, like probably the topology should be similar. And um, of course, there's a lot of variation between the subjects, but um, there is still some um, some overall effect. In particular, if you look for plasticity or like small changes in healthy population. Um, the connections which are like more similar uh, are probably easier to detect changes than those connections who have like a have high variance. So therefore, I, I like this approach like to, to do this graph matching. But again, here I was wondering if uh, there you also try to use some filtering techniques to remove like connections which are maybe false positive and which introduce like additional variants which, and which makes the matching more difficult? I did not try to do that. I used the plain streamline count to compute the weighted connectons. And that's definitely the next step of the analysis. The reason why I did not do that 
is that uh, uh, we wanted to focus specifically on the problem of the choice of the atlas. The mm -hmm. atomic pipeline is already very, very long. So inserting a, a, a layer, let's call it a layer of complexity given by the tractography filtering, which is, uh, I mean, in, in, this, uh, in this audience, uh, we are all here and we are happy about the tractography filtering because we are studying it uh, or we are somehow interested uh, in understanding what it does. But if we ask uh, to the whole community, probably there's more than someone that uh, would be against the, against this because somehow increases the complexity of the pipeline and we don't know yet. We don't have a clear understanding of the beneficial uh, uh, effects of, uh, of uh, including it. So is it, is it possible that the like the, the good performance of the low postulations like the Desican Atlas, which has these huge regions compared to like the HPC Atlas is maybe due to such uh, like false positive connections, which are like not so robust and therefore like highly variable. So I could imagine like that if you would remove like the weak connections in the HPC postulation, that also the performance would improve and maybe would get, uh, yeah, it would score better than maybe the DESI can. Do you think this is possible? Yes, that's an interesting perspective, definitely. Uh, I did not think about that before and the reviewers did not point this out in uh, their comments. But uh, definitely we know for a fact that uh, there is some uh, consistency in the kind of errors and in the kind of false positives that we, we get out of a, of a connect on. Well, not all, of that, not all of them are consistent, but there is something that we systematically get. And uh, uh, on this, uh, we are basically splitting the effect of the false positives across multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, edges of the connecting where we employ a higher resolution data. So definitely, uh, there would be more false positives in that, uh, in that sense. And uh, yes, I did not think about that before and that's definitely true. And that's one more reason to, to do this experiment, uh, doing the same analysis, including tractography filtering. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have everything is, is answered on my side. Okay. Thank you very much. So now the, the speech, the, the parole is, uh, to the PhD advisor, or the main PhD advisor, since it was co-advised with Samuel, Rachid de Rich. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, Matteo, for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, also for this uh, great work that you have done during this uh, three, year and, uh, three years and uh, three, four months since you, you joined us in early November, uh, 2017, yeah. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I was really uh, very impressed by uh, the amount of work, the amount and the quality of the work that you have done during all these uh, years. You have uh, uh, worked and contributed uh, in uh, different aspects of uh, diffusion MRI in many important work, many important uh, um, parts from uh, microscopic to uh, uh, to the macroscopic scale and uh, your contributions, I think that uh, they have been really greatly appreciated by all the, the, the members of the jury. And I would like to congratulate you for, uh, for that. I saw you working very hard uh, and also working with uh, not only just you, but also uh, uh, discussing and ex exchanging a lot with, uh, with some who I would like to Thank also your, your mentor, Sam, in this, uh, in, in this work, and also with uh, many uh, uh, members of the, uh, of the team. Uh, you have uh, contributed uh, to, to, to different uh, parts of uh, other related works that are not mentioned in, in your thesis. You worked with, uh, um, with other colleagues in the structure function mapping, in uh, uh, polarized, polarized light imaging with uh, Abib, and uh, with Sarah on uh, AI part. So, so many contribution and I really I'm very, uh, I have been very impressed by the, the, the breadth of uh, the, the, the work that you have done. And of course, when uh, you tackle this uh, 
thesis with uh, such a large spectrum, uh, it's uh, for sure very difficult to go very uh, deeply in each uh, part of this. And that's why you have, uh, you have not contributed as uh, maybe some members of the jury would uh, have seen you to contribute in the clinical part or in uh, other uh, mentioned uh, part. But I think, I, I think that the, for sure the, the, the work that has been done and it has been mentioned by all the jury members is, is uh, somehow uh, uh, exceptional. And I would like to congratulate you for, uh, for that. I have, usually I don't have questions, <laughs> but uh, you, you, you have been, uh, you, you have been so great during this uh, uh, thesis that I would like to, uh, to not challenge you, but just have to have your comment on two, on two uh, points. One related to the last part of the, uh, actually both are related to the last part of uh, uh, the work that you have done on uh, alignment and studying the, the, the topology. Uh, the, the, how would you, uh, uh, recommend the possibility to uh, uh, generalize what you have uh, uh, proposed uh, with respect to the alignment and uh, uh, what you have shown uh, for networks, for different kinds of networks, for example, uh, temporal networks or tem uh, networks that have uh, uh, negative weight. You mentioned that uh, in uh, some of your questions or uh, so, so, so would you think that uh, this, the, the kinds of tool and the kind of algorithm that you have uh, uh, presented are uh, possibly uh, extendable to other kinds of network? You know that we are more and more interested by dynamic uh, connectomes. We are more and more interested and we are going to, uh, to explore these kinds of uh, tools, adding the dynamics and studying more and more the, Temporal aspect. So, do you think that it, it's possible? Have you started to think about that? That's the first question. I let you answer, and then I give you the second one. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you for your kind words before. It's been my my personal honor and pleasure to work uh, under your direction. It's been just an incredible adventure that I will never forget. And um, going to your question. Uh, definitely, the kind of framework that we proposed can be used uh, uh, for uh, temporal and, and uh, negative weighted networks with little adaptation, like, sorry, yeah, I had the neighbor making big noises. Um, so definitely it can be used in this context, uh, not as it is, it needs a little bit of adaptation, like for example, for negative, uh, for, for functional connectors where we have both positive and negative correlations, for instance, we could align the positive part and the negative part separately, for instance, and then combine the alignments. Or uh, with temporal networks, uh, we could uh, explore, the, so the kind of, of search that we do, the, the, the graph traversal that we use to define our signature, just uh, explores the level of the, of the network where it is defined. But when we have the dynamics, so we have multiple graphs at different time points, we could explore the possibility to, uh, to do a traversal that goes through the dynamics also of the network, not only on the topology at a specific time point. So definitely that can be, I would, I would take my words carefully, but uh, I, that can be easily uh, embedded in such a situation. So definitely doing alignment between dynamics, uh, function and all these things, uh, is doable with adaptations of our technique. Okay, so very happy to to, to have this uh, this uh, answer because because uh, since you are going to to stay with us at least uh, until the end of this ERC, I will challenge you to <laughs> to to work toward these directions and to hopefully uh, uh, implement it. The, se the second one is uh, related to. Uh, another way actually to study uh, the topology and uh, the structures of the connectome. Uh, yeah, you know that the, one of the problem of the connectome is that uh, at, at the big, very early part of uh, this connectivity matrices, you have somehow to 
uh, to threshold the connections uh, either to work for binary uh, uh, agency matrices or for agency matrices that have uh, uh, where you keep only the, the, the strong connection. And this thresholding has an important uh, uh, impact on all the, the steps for after. So uh, one way to, uh, to escape from this is uh, to do a sort of um, uh, invariant analysis over the, the scale of the threshold. And this is what actually a persistent homology do. And uh, I, I have tried to, <laughs> to push you toward, uh, toward this. I remember having invited the Muka Chang uh, during a week uh, in our group. We discussed about that. We started to, uh, to implement uh, some of uh, uh, this idea, but uh, okay, for one reason or another, we, you didn't um, went very deeply in this, uh, in this uh, this route. So do you think that uh, it's worth to continue to think about that? Or that, uh, I'm sure that, that you have started to think or you have a very good uh, analyze, analysis and comment on that. So is it worth to, to continue to, uh, to explore this persistent homology to characterize the topology of the connector? Or do you think that it, uh, it is wrong way? So. As, uh, as you tangentially uh, mentioned, uh, I, put a, I put actually a lot of enthusiasm uh, into the problem of uh, using persistent topology. At the beginning, uh, when we started the reasoning also with, uh, uh, with, with Mukachan. But um, so as it is, persistent topology, it, it's very difficult to use. There's actually a very recent paper that has been put on BioArchive uh, where basically they say that uh, it is not enough to show differences between populations. That's the one liner with which I would uh, summarize this work. So basically persistent homology answers in my, uh, asks in my opinion, the, the correct question, which is given a weighted network, what is uh, the, uh, the geometry somehow of the, uh, the polytope and of the uh, and of the scaffolds that we get uh, out of the multi-resolution analysis of this uh, of this weighted graph, uh, which is very interesting. But probably the persistence of the homological properties uh, is not the correct tool. Uh, this is just this is pure speculation that I'm doing. Uh, is probably not the correct tool to tackle the problem of distinguishing populations and pathologies and everything with uh, with brain networks. There are a number of persistences that we can look at. Uh, we can look at the persistency, for instance, uh, of, uh, uh, of graph theoretical measures above uh, uh, on, the, um, on the filtration that we build with the persistent homology machinery. Uh, but definitely it's worth exploring the possibility to have other kinds of persistences that may exhibit differences that are interesting to us. Uh, I don't have the evidence uh, that allows me to say that uh, we have to stop looking at persistent of the persistence of the homological properties, and uh, I, did not, I did not do enough experience on that. Uh, there is some initial indication that probably homology is not enough. Uh, homology is very useful in other fields uh, of uh, network science. For example, in uh, computational geometry, it is a fundamental tool that just uh, Nowadays, uh, it's very trendy, very used, uh, and it, it allows to get substantially better results than before in a fraction of the time because the, the beautiful mathematics behind it allows to do very allows to do very complete computations uh, in a fraction of uh, of what we were doing before. But probably, as I said, the homology is not enough. We should look into other directions, but still with persistence. The intuition that mm -hmm. there is a, a filtration. Of, uh, of geometrical structures that build up our connector, uh, taking into account all the resolutions at which it acts. This is something that is definitely important to explore, I believe, because it provides a, a very high level of, abstra of, of abstraction that uh, it's too mathematically beautiful to not be exploited. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I agree. I agree with, uh, with you uh, in the sense that uh, the, the uh, the importance should be put in the persistence, in the invariance. Uh, 
because uh, the, the, the problem when we work with uh, this uh, agency matrices is that we, uh, as I said, uh, you have some hope to threshold and then all what you, have, what you have some as result and analysis will depend hardly on this, uh, on, on this threshold. Uh, but, but if uh, we escape from this and we study uh, the, the, the net work at all the scales without uh, to, to, to threshold, then all what is invariant with respect to this threshold will uh, certainly be of uh, extreme importance for the uh, for the rest. So, uh, okay, my <laughs> idea, Matteo. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, having uh, uh, and being able to to answer to all this uh, long series of questions with long series of answers because you your answers were not short. Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. And uh, on behalf of all the, uh, the Athena team and all uh, the, uh, the, the group, I would like to congratulate you and uh, thank you really uh, very, very much. President, it's up to you now. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Jean-Philippe, you made some provisions to ask again some questions at the end. So no, I, I, I saw you, you switched on the camera, that's why I'm asking. Okay. So then it's my duty to finish the, the series of questions. And usually the president has, is allowed not to ask, but I, you know maybe that I'm always asking some questions. Yes, and, please. and fortunately, I have some questions, even though I'm probably the less experienced in diffusion MRI in the panel. But yet I will finish with some questions. I hope that will, the answer will be quick. Don't hesitate to say yes and no. Uh, some of them are I will. very naive. So the first and maybe the most naive question is um, in, the, in the filtering uh, technique that you proposed us, well, you still start from the, from the tractography. So is this uh, a doom? Uh, uh, is there a way, would, would there be a way to directly relate the diffusion MRI measurements directly to a connectome without going through the parcellation or are we doomed to, to, to have this non-quantitative non uh, step in, in, in between. So what is your feeling here? So what you're asking is basically to not do, do filtering, but still get information about the function uh, on top of the tractography. Yeah. But there is some initial work that has been done, uh, I think uh, from the group of Aaron Conley. Um, it's uh, something like, Track weighted dynamic functional connectivity, I believe it's called. And uh, it does a bit what you say. So basically, it takes the functional connectivity, it takes the structural connectomes uh, and it weights them by the dynamics that uh, is given by the function. So this goes in that direction, but I believe it is a different problem with respect to what we treat uh, with our framework because, because we rely on tractograms. So on, uh, like, on the it's somehow somehow a high resolution way to solve the problem because we go at the resolution of streamlines while they go, they take a connectum, they take a, a network and they reweight it. What we do is a bit more uh, at lower level. Okay. Uh, uh, we can rediscuss that later probably um, since you're there. Uh, then I will switch to the third and your last uh, contribution about the, the graph matching uh, work. And uh, my first, it's almost a comment. Um, well, I kind of disagree with Maxime. Uh, as a functional guy, I'm more interested in mapping maybe functions instead of mapping nodes of a mesh. So I, I slightly disagree with him uh, on, on that side. Uh, and I think there is value in trying to grouping the nodes of a mesh with some functional uh, signal and data. But uh, well, from your metric, your, your similarity measure, the Jacquard index, uh, uh, basically I would say that something is wrong there because I think that even if you take a, a whole brain parcel, it will be even that better than the Desican uh, Atlas. So I wonder whether there is not some bias in your, in your similarity measure and the same way as we need to to, um, to correct for the number of parameters when we do a regular, you know, the Akai K criterion or uh, minimum length, uh, well, all these kind of IDs, whether we should not use such a kind of IDs in order to, to in some way, find a better mid-level uh, mid 
optimum instead of uh, having a, well, the, the coarsest uh, atlas being the best. So I'm not sure I completely understood your question and I would well, apologize you, for well, that. Maybe but, uh, the question is, do we need to correct in some way for the number of initial parcels in the similarity we, results? We partially do that. Uh, well, we do that indeed in the plot that I was showing on the bottom right, I believe, uh, which is the um, Jacquard index ratio, which is the graph Jacquard index. So the, sim the pure similarity measure divided by the average similarity between the subjects in the population. So we basically uh, normalize by the variability that we have within the subject. And this depends, uh, of course, uh, from the number of parcels also, among other things. So partially we do that. Uh, and with uh, looking at this uh, Jacquard index ratio, what we get uh, is the plateau somehow. I don't know if you remember that we were observing that plateau. I can research the slide if you want, but uh, basically we see that after 300 parcels, the performance is uh, comparable from 300 to 1000. So okay. definitely taking into account this difference makes a difference into the analysis. And uh, it's, the, it's, I believe, uh, one of the right directions, uh, one of the correct directions towards which, uh, towards which uh, we should be looking for. Okay. Well, uh, just as a last comment, uh, I think that only, only doing from the average of the, all the subjects is one thing, but you, there is probably some theoretical curve that is also true just with the number of parcels. But, well, okay. And yeah, then that, that uh, is true. maybe uh, uh, a last question. Uh, what was it? Uh, or maybe if I don't find it, if that's fine. You already asked it still. You no, said two times no, this no. is the last question. No, yeah, but my, my last question was about, okay, you took the, the idea of just using the edges in your graph matching. Yes. Uh, but there is also some structure. You, you, you totally uh, erased the fact that while well, two, two closed neighbor parcels they are connecting. So first quick question, have you checked some because you had a huge number of of, uh, of matching. So have you checked that at least some matching are reasonable or are there, were there some obvious uh, non-plausible connections made by your by your technique? And then do you think that there is a value in adding also a little bit of the the, the neighborhood or at least some some localization uh, uh, criterion somewhere? Yes. So your question has. Two answers to the two points. First of all, yes, there's. It makes sense to add the, the, for example, the position of the region, the average position of the region to the signature vector. Like we take our WL vector and then we attach uh, the three-dimensional uh, coordinates uh, of the centroid uh, of the of the region. Uh, why that? Because second answer. Um, we have uh, some. Uh, we, we have looked at some of the results, in particular to the Desican Atlas, because it's a bit more readable. Uh, no, Desican Atlas. I think the, the Glasser Atlas. It's uh, because it is uh, in a scale that uh, it's still readable despite being uh, very high resolution. And we see that uh, sometimes when we have an incorrect matching, we are actually matching to the parcel that is next to it, uh, next to the one that we should be correcting. This uh, suggests that probably. There is uh, some variability within subjects uh, that at the level of sulcus uh, or gyrus uh, is not uh, visible because the Desican Atlas doesn't see it. But in the specific localization within, within the, 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 the gyrus, uh, would the, a specific function or a specific bundle would be attached to some other, um, to, 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 a, to a close location to the, uh, with respect to the original one. So definitely. There is, that's something that we should uh, we should uh, observe. Uh, not that, you're, that we should analyze better, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, an interesting point. Okay, I will stop here because you, you, have, you have been answering questions for quite some time. So thank you very much. Um, what I will try now, so the jury will will deliberate. Uh, what I will try is to put you in the waiting room so that you don't need to disconnect and reconnect. No, I can disconnect. I mean, okay.
So you can text me when uh, you, you can text You and Giovanni me. can disconnect and yes. I will send you an email. It works very well with the waiting room, Theo. It works very well with the waiting room. Okay, so, so I will put you in the waiting room. Okay, so text me when I get... The only question is back. whether we are still online on, on YouTube or not. No, we, we, when I go out I and Giovanni go you out... in the waiting room. Yeah, the moment they are in the waiting room, you are no longer online. They will no longer be on YouTube. Ah. Okay. That, that but the recording is still running, right? I think that, that was my question. Sorry? The recording. Yeah, probably stopped I the have recording. a recording still running, so I would I should stop the recording. You're recording. Yeah, I have it here. Okay. So, Matteo, uh, the jury has appreciated a lot the variety of contribution in different domains of, of the diffusion MRI. These contributions were timely and, uh, and covered a large spectrum of diffusion MRI uh, work and opened up a lot of uh, problems and perspectives. So the jury appreciated that. The jury also appreciated that uh, your contributions were mathematically well-grounded and, uh, and uh, profound. Um, we also noticed that uh, you have already good publications and more are, are coming. And through this publication, uh, it shows also your ability to work in team when it's necessary, which is a very nice quality. Um, you answered uh, in a very long series of questions. So you handled them very well uh, and showing uh, mature uh, maturity in both the presentation and the question and the question answers. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, we also want to pinpoint and to emphasize the very important so software contribution you've made. Um, sorry, uh, with, uh, with the impact on the research reproducibility that it gives to your work. And that's a very, very nice thing to have. So for all these re uh, reasons, uh, the jury uh, uh, discerns you. The, the grade of uh, PhD, uh, PhD doctorate or the doctorate from University of Côte d'Azur and, uh, and congratulates you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, to all the members of the jury in particular, if I may take a few minutes, it will be very short. I'm sorry, after three hours and a half, we all want to look to it. But uh, uh, I want to take. Uh, Matteo, I'm just interrupting you. Uh, Ragini has, has an appointment. Uh, very, very. I will wait. Yeah, I yeah. have to run. So, but yes, it's okay. I'll wait. They will wait too. So just do it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, Let's have your speech. <laughs> I, will be, I will be very quick. I will start by thanking the reviewers and the examiners for taking the time to examine my, my PhD thesis and for taking the time to stay here today in this very long uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you very much also for the adaptability in all the organization of this, uh, of this event that uh, combines uh, several time zones. It's not easy, but thank you a lot. Uh, I want to thank then uh, Rashid and Sam that supervised and directed this thesis. They have been uh, wonderful mentors. I learned so much from them. I wish uh, more people could have the honor of working with them. I've been the lucky one this time, but certainly for, uh, for Sam, more are uh, yet to come. And for Rashid, uh, I hope uh, he takes back the word uh, that uh, he doesn't want more PhD students. I hope for the new generations. But um, yes, thank you very much to the two of you. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful working with you. It's uh, been a great honor and, same, and pleasure. Then uh, I will quickly thank all of the collaborators that I had in these, uh, in these years. I will not mention each of them because let's try to think it up. But yes, certainly the people from Raginis Lab in New York, in California, uh, in here in Security Police, uh, Rutger in Paris, so everywhere. Then, uh, of course, I want to thank my lab mates. They've been uh, my fellow, fellow sufferers through this. Uh, this adventure and I'm really happy I had the possibility to, to have uh, this adventure together with them. They, are, they have been just the best. 
Uh, thanks, Claire. I don't think she she is here now because she texted me that she couldn't make it. But thanks anyway for the assistance, the administrative assistance. And in particular, just two scientific names I want to make: Mauro and Rutger. I've learned uh, so much from them in the field of diffusion MRI. They have been incredibly patient with me. They teach me a lot, both about diffusion coding and everything. And Emanuele, uh, that teach me everything, almost uh, everything that I know about graph alignment now. Uh, finally, a final thanks for all my mentors uh, before in a PFL in the lab of Gian Philippe. Some of them are now in Verona, like Alessandro De Gucci, and my mathematical mentors that are in Verona, like Marco Cagliari, Gian Domenico Orlandi, Luca Di Persis, Simone Zucca, and all the others. Final thanks for all my friends, the one in uh, Carmignano di Brenda, Grazie Fusi, uh, the ones in Verona, the ones here in Nice. Uh, and my huge family of cousins, sounds and uh, grandmothers that is watching. And uh, final thank uh, to three persons. One is Otavia, who is next to me. She's the best surprise uh, that I've had in these two years. And uh, it's just wonderful to have you. And then uh, there are my parents that are the only reason why I made it through these two years. It's really a great pleasure to be your son. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you for your patience. Well, uh, well. <laughs> With the sound. And normally, but I don't know what happens, there should be an event. So some people should join us right now, but I don't see them coming. Gentlemen, can I run, please? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, for the Thank you very much. Bye. I think that uh, uh, it, 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 we can do this stuff. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Thanks Congrats a lot, Ragini. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ragini, for all your time. And thanks to all the, the jury. Yeah. Thanks to all of you. You have been really great in asking all the questions. I, I think Bye, Dr. I, 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 well, Matteo, the, the team was supposed to join us right now, but uh, I don't know some so there is some glitch somewhere. So we probably will have some other connections for, for yeah, we, <laughs> we can do it in the next days if you want. Uh, we, yeah. Bye bye guys. Thank you, Jean Philippe. Thank you, Jean -Philippe. Okay. Thank you for Salut. Uh, uh, Salut. Au revoir, merci à tous. Merci encore. Merci, merci encore. Merci, 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 merci. merci. Ok. Do we wait for the others? I don't oui, know. Il fallait, fallait d'abord que le jury parte pour que, le, pour que les autres. Non, non, non. J'avais dit qu'une fois que j'annonçais le résultat, j'ai envoyé un mail dès que, en, en même temps, j'avais préparé le mail et tout. Tu peux annuler le recording. Je pense que là, c'est moins important. Oui. Tu peux faire ça. Oui, oui. Tu peux faire ça.